important. So good morning, everyone, and welcome back to day two of our emergency ACIP meeting today to discuss coronavirus vaccines. Um, I'm going to actually turn it over to Dr. Wharton just to ask if there's any additional announcements we need to run through today, and then I will run through roll call. Uh, no, no additional announcements. Just uh, thank you to our members for uh, reconvening today and for the CDC staff who've, who are supporting the meeting as well as those who are listening in. Thank you. We are going to start today uh, with roll call of our members. And um, I'm just going to try and do my best to go in the order that it shows up on my screen. Dr. Bell. Bell? Hey, Dr. Lee. You okay, we'll great. move on. To I'm sorry. You don't sound great in our room. I don't know how you sound over everybody else. Grace, Grace, you don't sound as clear as you did yesterday. Okay. Thank you. Hold on one second. Is this better? Talk a little more. <laughs> Now it's a 10. Now it's a 10? Okay. <laughs> oh, that sounds no, much that, better. That's, that's a lot better. 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 Okay. Thank you, everybody. I appreciate that. Um, we'll start with, let's see if Dr. Bell is able to unmute. Dr. Bell? Okay. Let's come back to Dr. Bell. Here, we'll go here, to I, am. here I am. Sorry, oh. I'm having more kinds of technical problems here. Um, yes, so I am uh, Beth Bell, clinical associate, clinical professor, Department of Global Health. University of Washington, uh, and I have no conflicts. Thank you, Dr. Bill. Uh, Dr. Chen. Uh, good morning, everyone. Wilbur Chen, uh, Professor of Medicine at the University of Maryland School of Medicine. I have no conflicts. Thank you. Dr. Daly. Good morning, Matt Daly, um, Senior Investigator, Kaiser Permanente, Colorado, Associate Professor, Department of Pediatrics, University of Colorado School of Medicine. I have no conflicts. Thanks. Thank you. Dr. Lair. Dr. Jamie Lair, owner of Cuga Family Medicine, a private family practice in Ithaca, New York. I have no conflicts of interest. Thank you. Dr. Paling. Professor Paling. I am professor of pediatrics and epidemiology of prevention at Wake Forest School of Medicine. Wake Forest School. And do you have any conflicts? I have no conflicts. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Stanley. I have no conflicts. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Dr. Talbot. Good morning. I'm Kip Talbot. I'm an associate professor of medicine and health policy. I do adult infectious diseases and I have no conflicts. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Bata. Good morning, Lynn Bata. I am a public health nurse serving as the immunization clinical consultant at the Minnesota Department of Health, and I have no conflicts. Thank you. Ms. McNally. Good morning, Veronica McNally, president of the Franny Strong Foundation based in Michigan, and I have no conflicts. Thank you. Dr. Long. Hi, I'm a pediatric infectious disease physician, professor of pediatrics at Drexel University College of Medicine in Philadelphia, and I have no conflict. Thank you. Dr. Sanchez. Good morning. Um, Pablo Sanchez, I'm professor of pediatrics at the Ohio State University College of Medicine. I'm a neonatologist and pediatric infectious disease specialist at Nationwide Children's Hospital in Columbus, and I have no conflict. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Brooks. Oliver Brooks, Chief Medical Officer, Watts Healthcare Corporation in Los Angeles, and I have no conflicts. Good morning. Good morning. And apologies to my West Coast colleagues. Uh, this is Grace Lee. Uh, I am a professor of pediatrics at Stanford University School of Medicine, Associate Chief Medical Officer for Practice Innovation at Stanford Children's Health, and I have no conflicts. Are there any additional members on the call? Okay, thank you. Uh, we do have quorum today, so we can proceed. And um, 
Since we don't have any additional announcements, we'll uh, uh, turn it over to Dr. Matt Daly to provide the introduction for day two of our meeting today um, as we head towards a vote by the end of today. Thank you. Thanks so much. So um, I'm Matt Daly and I'm speaking on behalf of the ACIP COVID-19 vaccines work group. Next slide, please. So <clears throat> to start with, I wanted to um, just reiterate um, several FDA updates. So um, as, as folks are well aware, on uh, June 16th of 2022, the FDA granted emergency use authorization or an EUA for a two-dose Moderna COVID-19 vaccine primary series for administration to individuals ages six months through five years. In addition, a third primary series dose was authorized in the same age group, age group for individuals with certain kinds of immunocompromise. In addition, a three-dose Pfizer-BioNTech COVID-19 primary vaccine series for administration to individuals ages six months through four years of age was also authorized. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> and then in addition, on June 16th of 2022, the FDA gr granted emergency use authorization for a two-dose Moderna COVID-19 vaccines primary series for administration individuals ages 6 through 17 years of age. And in addition, a third primary series dose was uh, authorized for individuals in this same age group with certain kinds of immunocompromise. Next slide, please. Um, and so to review um, yesterday's meeting, um, yesterday we, we reviewed the epidemiology of COVID-19 in young children. We also examined what was known about real world vaccine effectiveness in children older than the age group we're discussing today. We also reviewed safety and immunogenicity of the Moderna COVID-19 vaccine two dose primary series in children six months through five years of age. We reviewed data regarding safety and immunogenicity of the Pfizer BioNTech COVID-19 as a three dose primary series in children ages six months through four years of age. And then um, at the close of the meeting, we reviewed ACIP COVID-19 vaccine workgroup interpretation of safety, immunogenicity and efficacy of Moderna and Pfizer BioNTech COVID-19 vaccine primary series data. And then we heard public comment. Um, next slide, please. So the agenda for today is as follows. We'll hear from Dr. Chatham Stevens from the CDC who will review implementation considerations regarding pediatric COVID-19 vaccines. Following that talk, we'll hear from Dr. Oliver from the CDC who will review evidence to recommendations framework for the use of mRNA COVID-19 vaccines in young children. Following that, we'll hear a clinical considerations update from Dr. Hall and Dr. Oliver from the CDC. Following that, we'll have discussion, and then following that, we will have two votes, one for each vaccine product. Next slide, please. Um, I just want to thank the ACIP COVID-19 Vaccines Workgroup, including ACIP members, ex officio and government members, liaisons, consultants, and, and our uh, outstanding leadership of Dr. Sarah Oliver. Next slide, please. Um, and then uh, a, a large number of CDC participants who've worked tirelessly to, to prepare us all for these for these important de decisions and discussions. Next slide, please. Uh, thank you very much. I turn it back to you, Dr. Lee. Thank you, Dr. Daly. And we will head straight into Dr. Kevin Chatham-Stevens' presentation on implementation of pediatric vaccines. Great, thanks so much for the opportunity to chat with y'all uh, this morning about some of our efforts uh, to plan for this very important vaccine rollout. So next slide, please. Our goal in this vaccine rollout for children under five years really mimics our overarching goal in the five to 11 and adolescent vaccine programs. That is to ensure that all children have access to the vaccine. And similar to the vaccine rollout for children five to 11 years old, we're planning for an all day above approach, working to ensure that vaccine is widely available in different locations throughout communities. However, we do understand that there'll be some key differences between the five to 11 rollout and the under five vaccine rollout. For example, for five to 11 year olds, approximately one third of those kiddos were vaccinated in pharmacies and just under 10% in school located vaccination clinics. And so we anticipate those two settings in particular will be less prominent in the under five vaccine program and that primary care physicians such as pediatricians and family practice doctors in the medical home, such as private pediatric clinics, federally qualified health centers, local health departments, et cetera, will play a larger role, especially for the younger children in this age group. We still anticipate that pharmacies will play a critical role 
for example, in having vaccine available at nights, on weekends, and on holidays when clinics may be closed. In local health departments, especially in rural areas, and our federal partners such as IHS and HRSA's federally qualified health centers and rural health clinics will continue to serve critical roles in contributing to vaccine equity. Early care and education programs like Head Start and other support programs such as WIC will play more prominent roles in this vaccine program given their roles as trusted messengers to families of children in this age group. Next slide, please. So to estimate how well a network of likely pediatric vaccine providers will cover children under five years, a mapping analysis was conducted to assess the proportion of children under five years of age that reside within five miles of a likely vaccine provider. We considered as likely vaccine providers approximately 18,000 non-pharmacy providers that have ever administered vaccine to children five to 11 years old, assuming they were also administered vaccine to children under five years of age, and approximately 4,000 pharmacies that expressed interest in offering vaccine to children under five years. The analysis found that when these two sets of providers are combined and mapped, overall, approximately 85% of children under five years reside within five miles of a likely vaccine provider and 94% within 10 miles. Next slide, please. We know that vaccinating in the medical home is incredibly important as the medical home provides comprehensive primary care that facilitates partnerships between children, families, and clinicians. And routine immunizations typically occur in the medical home. As an example, for the 2020 to 2021 flu season, approximately 80% of children six months through four years of age who received a flu vaccine were vaccinated in their doctor's office. This is compared to the very low percentages of children this age who were vaccinated at a pharmacy, including less than 1% of children 6 to 23 months of age, and approximately 4% of children 2 to 4 years. In addition to vaccination, medical homes are also places for children to get recommended screenings for a variety of issues, including developmental and vision screening, and anticipatory guidance that helps them thrive in a safe environment. Next slide, please. So to get at the COVID-19 vaccine practices and intention to vaccinate children aged less than five years among pediatric clinics in medical homes, pediatric clinicians in medical homes, sorry, we surveyed several thousand vaccines for children providers in March. We've included some of these preliminary unpublished results for all providers, as well as results by urban or rural locations. Please note that the results on this slide are limited to those who were enrolled in the COVID-19 vaccination program. So as you can see, most of DSC providers have administered a COVID-19 vaccine to children aged five to 17 years at 85%. Almost uh, three quarters of all providers intend to offer COVID-19 vaccination to children under five years of age. This percentage is higher for urban providers at 76% compared with rural providers at 67%. And since not all clinics will have the vaccine and not all children have a medical home, we also asked whether the practice intends to offer COVID-19 vaccination to children who are not currently uh, patients of the practice, with approximately half of all provide, providers saying that they would do so. The percentage is higher for rural providers at 58% compared with urban providers at 49%. Next slide, please. I'll wrap up these last two slides by showing some of the select activities we've conducted to support health departments, clinicians, and others. During the past several months, we disseminated operational planning guides that included characteristics of the vaccines, key planning assumptions, and a planning checklist. We are also working on a Dear Colleague letter for VFC uh, providers, emphasizing the importance of their role in this vaccination program and providing various tips and resources. Uh, CDC is also engaged in a variety of vaccine competence boot camps, which are these uh, great interactive trainings to provide partners and participants with strategies for building vaccine confidence in their communities. Examples that are particularly relevant to this discussion include boot camps with the National Association of School Nurses, Early Care and Education Partners, and YMCA. We've also shared jurisdiction-specific maps of likely vaccine providers for children under five years. Jurisdictions have been able to use these maps to identify and then address gaps in provider availability. And our comms experts continue to release resources to promote the COVID-19 vaccine for children and teens, including social media graphics, videos, customizable materials, and various web pages, which are available at the link at the bottom of the slide. Next slide, please. And finally, we wanted to mention a planned new function, vaccines.gov. As a reminder, vaccines.gov serves two major purposes. One um, is to enable the public to identify nearby providers with vaccine in stock and learn how to make an appointment. 
And two, it enables providers to report their COVID-19 vaccine inventory. And to prepare for the rollout of vaccines for children under five years, a new function will be added that enables the minimum age that can be vaccinated at a location in months and years to be displayed. And you can see an example screenshot of this function on the right. The CDC will be monitoring inventory as the vaccines are delivered starting Monday to clinics, pharmacies, and other clinical settings to determine when the search for the under five vaccines will be available on vaccines.gov. And in addition to vaccines.gov, parents and caregivers can reach out to their child's pediatrician or family practice doctor, their local health department, pharmacy, et cetera, to ask if they have the vaccine, understanding that not every clinic or pharmacy will get their vaccine on Monday. We know that some vaccine providers were waiting for the emergency use authorizations and CDC recommendations before ordering the vaccine. They wanted to see the data to help them decide which of the two vaccines to order. So we expect the vaccine provider network to expand as these providers order their vaccine post EUA or post ACIP. And just note that some vaccine providers may not begin notifying their patient population or opening up vaccine appointments until they have vaccine in stock. So we do anticipate that the vaccination program is going to ramp up in the days and weeks that follow with more and more doses and more and more appointments becoming available. So that's all I have for you all this morning. Thanks again so much for the opportunity to discuss our planning efforts. Thank you very much, Dr. Chatham Stevens. And this presentation is now open for questions. Dr. Paling. Thank you, Dr. Tobes, for a great presentation, sharing the many ways that the vaccine is planned to be rolled out. Uh, that provided a lot of reassurance. What are the questions? The question I have for you is about the plans in Florida. Yesterday on the phone call, we heard from people concerned because the, but we understand the health department did not purchase the vaccine. So can you share what? Uh, is anticipated for that area. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for that. I'm actually going to defer that question to Dr. Meyer. Dr. Meyer? Hello. Hi. Yes, this is uh, Sarah Meyer. So, um, as mentioned, you know, Florida was able to place orders for COVID 19 vaccines starting yesterday. Those orders continue to come in and will be available for pediatric providers. Um, but also wanted to point out that uh, vaccine doses will be available through our federal programs. Um, including the federal retail pharmacy program and FHQCs. Um, and just to reiterate that um, we are very committed to ensuring that all children have equitable access um, to these vaccines um, all throughout the United States. Um, thank you. Thank you. Ms. McNally. Thank you, Dr. Chatham Stevens. I'm a consumer representative. So I just really want to try and understand a little bit more about the education efforts that have been made during the implementation preparation to prevent um, administration errors with the other composition of the vaccines. Sure, thanks for that. So I, I think that's been a multi-pronged approach that um, has been going on and will continue to go on as these vaccines are uh, launched and rolled out. I mentioned the operational planning guide, which did include um, some of the characteristics of the vaccine. And I believe that Dr. Oliver or Dr. Hall may get into this a little bit later, but um, the operational planning guide did include a couple of the um, you know, issues with the Pfizer uh, label um, in which you know, vials uh, you know, may state uh, two to under five years of age, as well as that the um, vial should be discarded six hours after the first dilution. And you know, the vials that are labeled that way can be used for the entire age group. And as stated in the EUA fact sheet, um, that post dilution timeframe can actually be 12 hours, not six hours. And so I think that's one example of us you know, trying to make sure that uh, health departments, uh, pharmacies, clinicians, et cetera, understand some of the nuances uh, when it comes to these uh, vaccines. So we've been um, pushing that information out. I know Pfizer, for example, has also started including that type of information in uh, their webinars, um, which are held frequently uh, throughout the week. Um, so that's one example. And I know, um, you know CDC continues to work on a, a variety of clinical education materials. Um, these are the types of materials aimed at clinicians um, that have gone out with each vaccine launch. 
and we anticipate those will be available in the coming days. As I mentioned, um, the pharmaceutical companies will have will also have um, you know webinars to, to push this information out. Um, CDC is also um, going to have the usual kind of partner engagements, um, you know, starting next week um, with our health department uh, and clinical partners. Um, so I would say be on the lookout for that information as we do um, push that information out and schedule those calls. Thank you. And just so parents have the information, if they are concerned about administration errors, uh, would the CDC please comment on what they should do? Sure. So I, I think the, the standard approach anytime there is concern for, um, you know, an administration or any other type of error following a vaccination is to have it reported through VAERS and also wanted to highlight, you know, this is an opportunity to really call out um, Be Safe as well, you know, which is a smartphone based um, program that allows uh, parents that, you know, will check in with parents after the vaccine has been administered. And that's also another, um, uh, you know, opportunity to provide feedback. Um, on these particular vaccines. So I would say, you know, talk with the vaccine provider, obviously, and bears and be safe for additional opportunities. And I know there are probably our vaccine safety colleagues on the line and they can um, provide additional information on that. Thank you. Um, Dr. Goldman, you, did you want to respond to the prior question or did you have a new question? Oh, sorry, is somebody speaking? Apologies, I can't hear who that is. I think that's Dr. Goldman, is that you? I'm trying to speak. Oh, okay, thank you. Are you able um, to Dr. Goldman, you? we'll come. Oh, thank you. Yes, did you have a, did you want to respond to the prior question or did you have a new question? Well, it was in relation to Florida and, and somewhat of a new question. Okay, please go ahead. So thank you uh, for this great presentation. Um, given that some jurisdictions um, are actively discouraging the use of this vaccine uh, in uh, various states, will there be any future efforts to revise how vaccines will be provided for the states uh, in order to ensure equity that all physicians can uh, obtain access to the vaccine? Or will we, will we be going with the current process? might defer that one again to Dr. Meyer if she's available. Hi. Yes. Thanks for that question, Jason. I mean, I think we will continue to have to discuss this and look into various options. There haven't been any decisions made at this time about how vaccines will continue to be provided and if it's going to remain the same or, or change. So I think we'll just have to keep um, continuing that dialogue and update the committee whenever there is more information to share. Thank you. Dr. Daly. Yeah, thanks so much. Um, Dr. Chatham Stevens, I have a, a, a two part question. Um, you know, in in public comments that we've received, particularly in the in the docket, there are um, individuals in the public who are who are rec who are asking us not to recommend these vaccines. And and really two of the themes that they raise are concerns about vaccine safety and then also questioning the need for vaccines in this age group. And so I wonder if you could <clears throat> speak to the extent to which we address both of those issues in our in our communications. And then the second part of the question is just related to um, how you've um, uh, uh, met with or coordinated those messages with um, national organizations such as the American Academy of Pediatrics and the American Academy of Family Physicians. Thank you. So, yeah, I think we've, we've had um, frequent uh, engagement with a variety of partners over the past several months, really going all the way back to January when we were preparing for the um, possible anticipated launch in, in um, February um, with a variety of partners, including, as you mentioned, the American Academy of Pediatrics and the American Academy of Family Physicians, as well as a variety of other clinical groups and health department groups. And so I think, um, you know, our main messages are kind of what you all heard yesterday, that these vaccines are safe and effective. And we know that children, unfortunately, can um, have severe disease, need to be hospitalized, and unfortunately, you know, can die um, from COVID-19. And that we think that the best way to protect them is um, for them to get vaccinated. And so I think that's a kind of our, our core messaging there. 
Um, and that's something that we've been working with a variety of partners to push out. Um, you know, in terms of AAP in particular, um, we, as I mentioned, have had close communication with them. Our comms experts have been working um, with them to get input on a uh, pediatric quick conversation guide for clinicians, right? This is a guide that helps empower clinicians to have conversations with their patients and their families to answer some of those potentially difficult questions that you are bringing up, like, hey, like, why does my child need this? Is it safe? Is it effective? And so I think that's just one primary example of how we've partnered with a group such as AAP to make some of our products better. Thank you. Dr. Lair? Um, yeah, so comments and a question. Um, when we have 10 doses per vial, it makes it actually fairly difficult for private practices to make sure they're giving out all 10 doses at a time. And you actually have to sort of plan on scheduling patients. You also need extra nursing staff with the nursing stores that we're having. It's actually fairly difficult to coordinate many of these vaccine clinics. I'm wondering if anyone knows if there's any plans to change the number of doses per vial in the future for any of these vaccines. Thank you. Sure. In, in addition to the, the 10 dose per vial, we, we do continue to hear that, you know, no, um, clinicians really would prefer um, single dose uh, vials. Um, and so we continue to, to message that up. And I think everyone is aware um, that that is a, um, will definitely be a benefit in the longer term. Unfortunately, I, I, I've not heard of any near-term solutions for that. So we are looking at um, 10 dose vials uh, for this particular vaccine rollout. And if there are any changes, we'll obviously um, push that information out. And if anyone else um, from CDC or anywhere else on the line um, has additional information, please feel free to add to that. Dr. Hogue. Hey, following up on that question, um, I'm just wondering to what extent is the 10 dose vial issue one uh, that um, is driven by the manufacturers exclusively or to maybe the FDA could comment on whether that is because early in the pandemic as part of the uh, ramp up to try to get vaccine out quickly, 10 dose vials were required by the FDA. So I wonder it, can the FDA comment on when we might be able to move to single-use syringes or single-dose vials or something of that nature from a regulatory perspective? Does that come into play? Uh, hi, this is Jordan Fink from uh, FDA Office of Vaccines. So uh, I, I don't believe FDA has, has been driving the presentation of, uh, of the COVID vaccines um, uh, that are being used uh, in, in in this uh, effort to to combat the pandemic. Any presentation that uh, is proposed for use, we would we would evaluate and uh, assess the data to support its use, and and then authorize or approve that that presentation. Thank you. This is Kevin. If I can just add uh, real quick, we, we do understand wastage has been a concern um, for providers with the, the Tindos files. Um, and, you know, providers have done such an amazing job of minimizing wastage throughout the COVID-19 vaccine, you know, and, and the VFC program. Um, but we are encouraging folks to um, open up a vial, one of those 10 dose vials, even if it does mean you only have one or two patients left in your you know, clinic schedule for that day, you know, open up that vial and, and get those kiddos vaccinated, even if it does mean that um, the, the remainder of the doses will be wasted. So we are expecting um, you know, the potential for more wastage with this particular vaccine program, um, understanding the, the context in which it's happening. So just wanted to add that in as well, thank you. Dr. Lair. Just to follow up, it's actually not the 10 dose vial, it's the 12 hour time limit. Um, we have other 10 dose vials that we can use over days and weeks. And so I understand this is probably part of the mRNA manufacturing process and safety process. And I totally understand that. 
but it is the wastage issue. Um, and if you have someone coming in for a well visit and you give them a dose and you maybe have one other well visit in the same age group later in the day, it feels very awkward and uncomfortable to waste several doses every day just because you don't have enough people, but you still want to give that child the vaccine that's in front of you right now. So it is a conundrum for practicing physicians. Thank you. Yeah, and this is Kevin. Just once again, we would encourage providers um, to do what you said. It, you know, if they do have those two um, children scheduled that day who can get the COVID-19 vaccine, go ahead and open up that vial. Um, as I mentioned, we, we understand that that creates some angst amongst uh, providers, um, given uh, you know, all the messaging regarding minimizing waste, wastage in the BFC program and in the COVID-19 vaccination program. But just given some of the, the nuances and you know, challenges with this particular vaccine program, and as you point out, the 10 dose file and the 12 hour post dilution timeframe, we do anticipate that there will be um, potentially more wastage with this um, particular vaccine rollout. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Romero, did you wish to comment? I, I would. Thank you very much, Dr. Lee. Um, let me reinforce, um, again, let me reintroduce myself uh, because I, I know this is only the second time I've spoken to this committee. Um, I'm the newly appointed um, a director for the uh, National Center for Immunization and uh, Respiratory Diseases. Um, let me reinforce what has just been said. Um, it, it's important to vaccinate and to take every opportunity to administer the vaccine. Um, there is sufficient vaccine and that um, we understand that as pediatricians, as primary caregivers, uh, we have been very averse to wastage in the past. Um, uh, public health efforts and um, your efforts in your clinics um, uh, and uh, in, 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 in your offices um, is extremely important that we get this vaccine out. And um, there will be wastage, we understand that, um, but it is important to get shots into arms and take advantage of every opportunity. Um, we're going to have to do a reset of our of our uh, of these uh, this core principle among us. But it's important. Um, don't feel guilty about having to open a vial to administer two doses or one dose. Um, thank you, Dr. Lee, for allowing me to say that. Thank you, Dr. Romero. Are there any additional uh, comments or questions? One way, this is Kevin, and one way that we try to frame this is the shift from don't waste a dose to don't waste an opportunity to vaccinate a child. So that's one of the messages that we're trying to push out. Thanks so much. Thank you, Dr. Chatham Stevens. That was a great way to end that conversation. Um, terrific. I think I see no other additional hands raised. So uh, with everyone's permission, we can move on to the next. Uh, presentation by Dr. Sarah Oliver. Uh, she will present on the evidence to recommendations framework, mRNA COVID-19 vaccines in our youngest children. Dr. Oliver. Good morning and thanks so much. So I will be doing a combined ETR presentation for both mRNA vaccines uh, in this one presentation. Note that it's a bit of a lengthy presentation, but we really wanted to do a comprehensive review of the entire program for both vaccines in this age group as they will roll out at the same time, which we've not had in the COVID program to date. Uh, so hang with me and we'll make our way through all of this this morning. Next slide. Next slide. So ECIP is quite familiar with ETR at this point, but for others who may be listening for the first time, our evidence to recommendation framework is how we describe the information considered in moving from evidence to an ACIP vaccine recommendation to provide transparency around the impact of additional factors on deliberations when considering a recommendation. Next slide. These are the two policy questions we will be discussing. Should vaccination with Moderna, two doses at 25 micrograms, be recommended for children six months through five years of age under an EUA? And in addition, should vaccination with the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine, three doses at three micrograms each, be recommended for children six months through four years of age under an EUA? Next slide. Then this is the overall PICO question. 
the population, which we will refer to as young children in the slides, will either be six months through four years of age or six months through five years of age, depending on the vaccine of focus. Then the comparison group for both is to no vaccine. We aren't comparing the two vaccines to each other. Next slide. Then these are the ETR domains and questions. I'll show in the next few slides how we're gonna walk through this today with the two different vaccines. Next slide. So for the public health problem, we heard a detailed presentation yesterday on the epidemiology in young children, but I'll summarize and briefly discuss for the overall, the young pediatric population. Next slide. Then for values, acceptability, resource use, and equity, we will discuss the use of mRNA COVID-19 vaccines broadly in this age group. Next slide. And for benefits and harms and feasibility, we'll present manufacturer-specific data as well as manufacturer-specific workgroup judgments. Next slide. So for the public health problem, next slide. This graph shows the pandemic epi curve with the trends and number of COVID-19 cases in the U.S. among persons of all ages. As of June 14th, there have been more than 85 million total recorded cases of COVID-19 in the U.S., since April, we've seen an increasing number of cases, although perhaps with a slight decrease at the end of May. And at this point, the seven-day moving average is just over 100,000 cases. Next slide. Then during the pandemic, over 570,000 cases have occurred among infants, and more than 1.9 million cases occurred among children one through four years of age. Next slide. We can see here the COVID-19 associated hospitalization rates per 100,000 population among children and adolescents six months through 17 years from CDC's COVID net surveillance system. As we saw with COVID-19 cases and ED visits, hospitalization rates increased during the Omicron surge to the highest rates we've seen during the pandemic. And during 2022, the hospitalization rates were the highest among children six months through four years in these pediatric age groups shown in red than among children ages four through 11, five through 11 and adolescents 12 to 17. Next slide. So to further illustrate this point, we look at cumulative COVID-19 associated hospitalizations in the same age group. You can see that during the Omicron surge, among children six months through four years of age, the slope of the cumulative hospitalization rate took off more than it did for older children and adolescents and by March of 2022 was higher uh, among this age group than among adolescents. Of course, during the Omicron surge, both children five through 11 and 12 to 17 were eligible for vaccination. Next slide. Then this group shows the number of COVID-19 deaths per ch in children by single year age from January of 2020 through May 11th of 2022. These data are from uh, the National Center for Health Statistics or NCHS and are based on death certificate reporting. Again, among children ages six months through four years, there were 202 COVID-related deaths, which made up 1.7% of all deaths among children in this age group. Next slide. This slide was also shown yesterday that COVID is a leading cause of death among children and adolescents, among children ages one through four during the pandemic. Then the table shows the rank of COVID-19 among causes of death by age group uh, from March of 2020 through April of 2022. Next slide. Then this table is from that same publication listing the overall cause of death for children less than one year. You can see that the cumulative COVID uh, death ranks as a top five cause of death in children less than one year and is the only infectious cause of death listed. Next slide. Then this is for children ages one through four years. Again, the top five causes of death. And again, COVID-19 is the only infectious cause of death throughout this time frame. Next slide. Then we also saw this yesterday, but comparing the deaths for other vaccine preventable diseases prior to their recommended vaccines and COVID, and just in this specific age group, COVID caused more deaths than these other vaccine preventable diseases, many times with broader age groups defined. And this continues to dispel the myth that children do not bear any burden of a COVID-19 disease. Next slide. We know that not all COVID cases are captured using traditional surveillance methods because some cases are asymptomatic, not diagnosed or not reported. Tracking the proportion of the population with SARS-CoV-2 antibodies, which we call seroprevalence, can improve understanding 
of the population level incidence of COVID-19. The figure shows seroprevalence of infection-induced SARS-CoV-2 antibodies from the National Commercial Lab Surveillance from September 2021 through February 2022 by age group. Seroprevalence in all age groups increased substantially during Omicron. And as you can see, children six months through four years of age, which is in red, who um, have not been eligible for vaccination to date, had a larger increase in seroprevalence since December of 2021 than the other two age group. Um, again, we now have two additional months of data from what has been shown previously, and we see that there is a less steep rise in seroprevalence between February and the combined March-April time point, and seroprevalence in this age group is now estimated at 71%. Next slide. Then to further look at what we know about uh, infection in children uh, and adults who are seropositive, this figure shows the effectiveness of a primary SARS-CoV-2, so not Omicron infection, against Omicron reinfection by time since primary infection or vaccination. Uh, this study was among Quebec residents uh, in December of 2021 through March of 2022 in those 12 and over. You can see that the orange line representing those with prior infection but not vaccinated had the lower effect, lowest effectiveness or protection against reinfection. Similar data were found for effectiveness of vaccination of mRNA vaccine against COVID-19 hospitalization among adults previously infected in the second reference on the slide as well. Next slide. So we know antibodies produced by previous SARS-CoV-2 infection in the pediatric population may not neutralize the currently circulating Omicron variant and thereby uh, potentially they remain susceptible to reinfection with Omicron. Vaccine, and this was a study that was done in children, induced much broader neutralizing antibody response against variants of concern, including alpha, beta, gamma, delta, and Omicron, compared with natural immunity induced following the SARS-CoV-2 infection. This study highlights the importance of vaccinating children with prior infection to prevent both severe disease and future infections. Next slide. In summary, COVID-19 has caused uh, over 2 million cases among children ages six months through four years. We know children in this age group are at risk of severe illness from COVID. We heard yesterday that more than half of hospitalized children in this age group had no underlying medical conditions. We also saw yesterday that they can have similar or increased severity compared to older children and adolescents. And that the burden of COVID-associated death is similar to or exceeds that of other pediatric vaccine-preventable diseases. We also know that prior infection may not provide broad protection against newer SARS-CoV-2 variants. And we also heard data yesterday that the COVID-19 pandemic continues to have significant impact on families. So overall, next slide. The work group felt that yes, COVID among children ages six through four or five years of age is a public health problem. Next slide. So now moving to benefits and harms. Next slide. First, we'll discuss the Moderna vaccine with their grade summary, then the Pfizer vaccine also with a grade summary, then other considerations, which is includes a number needed to vaccinate assessment. Next slide. We discussed much of this in detail yesterday, so I won't go through everything again, but just as a reminder, data from the Moderna COVID-19 vaccine comes from one phase two, three randomized controlled trial conducted in the US. Participants were randomized three to one vaccine saline uh, to saline placebo. Then per protocol, the two co-primary endpoints were, uh, for immunobridging were geometric mean ratios and sero response. Efficacy data were also provided for symptomatic infection. Relative risks were calculated from cases in the study population and VE for grade was calculated based on these relative risks. In addition, a sensitivity analysis of VE was performed to include COVID-19 cases that were identified using home testing but lacking uh, PCR confirmation. Next slide. So first looking at the prevention of symptomatic lab confirmed COVID with pooled results among those ages six months through five years. Using the CDC case definition, we see a vaccine efficacy of 40.3% among those who are seronegative at baseline and a VE of 37.8% when those seropositive at baseline were also included. 
In a sensitivity analysis, including home tests, the VE was 36.6%. The VE of 37.8, using the CDC case, case definition among seropositive or seronegative is the outcome that was used in grade. Next slide. The Phase 2-3 trial was also designed to use immunobridging to evaluate efficacy, and we'll present those data to support the efficacy data already presented. Immunobridging studies are used to compare immunogenicity for a group of interest, so for here, children six months through um, 23 months or two to five years, with a comparison group and where efficacy has been demonstrated in clinical trials. So for this, it was uh, aid those adults aged 18 to 25 years. The immune response to vaccine was evaluated using a geometric mean ratio or GMR of adults to young, of children to young adults. Non-inferiority criteria are met when the lower bound of the 95% confidence interval for the ratio comparing the geometric mean neutralizing antibody titers for the two groups is not less than a preset value, which for this evaluation was 0.67. In both ages six months to 23 months and two to five years, the immune response to vaccine was non-inferior to that observed in those aged 18 to 25 years, with a GMR of 1.28 and the younger age groups in 1.01 in the two to five. Next slide. The grade assessment for the outcome of symptomatic lab confirmed COVID-19 using the direct efficacy as shown on the slide. The relative risk was 0.62. There were no serious concerns in the certainty uh, estimate and the final evidence type was type one. Next slide. Grade was also performed for symptomatic lab confirmed COVID using immunobridging. Among both age groups, the non-inferiority criteria were met. There were serious concerns of indirectness because immunogenicity is a surrogate marker of efficacy. And the final evidence type was moderate or type two. Next slide. Then the next outcome of interest is asymptomatic SARS-CoV-2 infection. For this trial, it was identified by absence of symptoms and at least one of the following. Binding antibodies against SARS-CoV-2 nucleocapsid protein, negative at day one that became positive later or a positive PCR test um, post baseline at a scheduled or unscheduled visit. And participants who were PCR positive at baseline were excluded. Next slide. Among children ages six months through five years, the VE against asymptomatic infection was 16%. The confidence interval of negative 18 to 40. This is the outcome that was used for grade. In addition, when home antigen tests were included, the VE estimate was 21% with a confidence interval of 4.5 to 35. Next slide. For the grade assessment of this outcome, the relative risk was 0.84. Serious concerns of indirectness because asymptomatic uh, SARS-CoV-2 PCR testing on the full cohort only occurred once, and serology was not done on all participants. There were also serious concerns of imprecision due to the wide confidence interval. And the final evidence type was low certainty or type three. Next slide. These are the data on the critical outcome for serious adverse events. In the phase two, three trial among both age groups, there were 24 participants who experienced 28 events among the 4,800 children in the vaccine group and three participants who experienced four events out of 1,600 in the placebo group for a comparison of 0.5% to 0.19%. One participant experienced two SAEs of fever and febrile seizure that were considered possibly related by FDA. No deaths were reported. Next slide. So for grade for SAEs, there was serious concern of indirectness due to the short duration of follow-up of two months after dose two. There were also very serious concerns for steady size and the width of the confidence interval. So the final evidence type was type four. Next slide. The next outcome for severe reactogenicity, grade three or four, the definitions are included here, but the overall main criteria for grade three or higher is typically a symptom that prevented daily activity. Next slide. Overall, 7.7% of vaccine recipients and 4.1% of placebo recipients reported a local or systemic reaction that was grade three or higher. The majority of these events were grade three. There were 15 fevers of 40 degrees or over in the vaccine group and three in the placebo group. Next slide. The grade assessment for reactogenicity relative risk was 1.87. There were no serious concerns in the certainty assessment and the final evidence type was type one. Next slide. So this table summarizes the grade assessment for the Moderna vaccine. 
In terms of benefits, the available data indicate that the vaccine is effective for preventing symptomatic COVID with an evidence type 1 from direct efficacy and type 2 from immunobridging. <clears throat> the vaccine did not demonstrate efficacy in the prevention of asymptomatic infection with an evidence type 3. In terms of harm, serious adverse events was type 4, and uh, the evidence type for reactogenicity was type 1. Next slide. So in conclusion, conclusion, efficacy seen um, after two doses of the Moderna vaccine in children ages six months through five years of age in the trial is consistent with the real-world vaccine effectiveness of other ages in Omicron, and the comparison of antibody levels met the immunobridging criteria, and the reactogenicity post-vaccine is consistent with other recommended vaccines in this age group. Next slide. Next, we'll move to grade for the Pfizer vaccine among children ages six months through four years. Again, we won't go over it in detail, but the Pfizer phase two, three trial was conducted in the US, Finland, Poland, and Spain. Participants were randomized two to one vaccine to saline placebo. The interval between dose one and dose two was 21 days. And the interval between dose two and dose three varied with a median of 11 to 16 weeks. Direct efficacy and immunobridging were per protocol primary endpoints and were evaluated. The median follow-up after dose three was 1.3 months. And again, VE from relative risk was also calculated. Next slide. Then we went through this in more detail yesterday, but the table again shows the study populations for each dose. While most of the randomized participants received the first two doses, only 32.9% of the vaccine arm and 30.7% of the placebo arm went on to receive a blinded third dose due to the protocol specified unblinding at six months after the second dose. Next slide. The three-dose vaccine efficacy estimate for symptomatic lab-confirmed COVID-19 among participants ages six months through 23 years was 76% for participants ages two through four years, the three-dose vaccine efficacy estimate was 81%, and the combined efficacy estimate was 80%. Next slide. The immune response to uh, vaccine in children ages six through 23 months and those two to four years was non-inferior to that observed in young adults ages 16 through 25 years. Again, with a geometric mean ratio of 1.19 in children ages six to 23 months, and a GMR of 1.3 in children ages two to four months. Next slide. Then again, for context, the trial was originally designed to, eval to be evaluated as a two-dose primary series. The two-dose vaccine efficacy for participants age six through 23 months was 15%, and non-inferiority criteria for immunobridging were met. The vaccine efficacy for those two through four years was 32%, However, non-inferiority criteria for immunobridging were not met. Next slide. So the grade assessment for the outcome of symptomatic lab-confirmed COVID was assessed using direct efficacy. There was serious concern for indirectness due to the short duration of follow-up of 1.3 months and very serious concern for imprecision due to the steady size. The final evidence type was low certainty or type four. Next slide. In addition to direct efficacy, we conducted the grade assessment for the outcome uh, of symptomatic lab-confirmed COVID assessed using immunobridging. There were serious concerns for indirectness because immunogenicity is a surrogate measure of efficacy, and the final evidence type for this was moderate or type 2. Next slide. For the evaluation of serious adverse events, the safety population included all randomized participants who received at least one dose of vaccine with the numbers listed here. Again, the median follow-up after dose three was 1.3 months for children six through 23 months and 1.4 months for children ages two to four years. Next slide. This is the data on serious adverse events after dose one, dose two, or dose three. The pooled SAEs among all participants aged six months through four years included 29 events out of 3,000 participants in the vaccine arm and 22 events out of 1,500 participants in the placebo arm for a comparison of one to 1.5%. One vaccine participant had two SAEs, fever and pain in an extremity that required hospitalization, considered possibly related by the investigator, and FDA considered the events potentially consistent with symptoms due to an unspecified viral myositis. No deaths were reported in trial participants. Next slide. So the grade assessment for serious adverse events, there was very serious concern for indirectness due to the short duration of follow-up one month post-dose three, 
and because only 32% of trial participants received dose three in the blinded follow-up, limiting the ability to detect serious adverse events that could occur at a higher rate after dose three. There were also serious concerns of imprecision due to study size, and the final evidence type was very low or type four. Next slide. Then again, for the reactogenicity definitions that are listed here, but again, the same overall grade three or higher is typically symptoms that interfered with daily life. Next slide. Among participants aged six months through four years, grade three or higher local reactions or systemic events after any dose was reported in 4.3% of participants in the vaccine arm and 3.6% of participants in the placebo arm. The majority of these events were grade three and there were six fevers of 40 or higher. Next slide. So for uh, grade, there was a relative risk of 1.2 with serious concern for indirectness was noted because again, only 31% of trial participants received the dose three, limiting the ability to detect severe reactogenicity that would occur specifically after dose three. So the final evidence type was moderate or type two. Next slide. So this table summarizes grade for Pfizer for children six months through four years. In terms of benefits, the available data indicate that the vaccine was effective in preventing symptomatic COVID. However, there was an evidence type four or very low certainty. And for the, for the direct efficacy evidence uh, data and an evidence of type two or moderate certainty for immunobridging. In terms of HAR, the ser harm, the serious adverse event reportings were comparable, but there was concern for indirectness and imprecision for type four. Um, and for reactogenicity, there was an evidence type two. Next slide. So in summary for Pfizer, the conclusions from the trial that the antibody levels seen after three doses in children ages six months through four years produce similar antibody levels after two doses in individuals 16 through 24 years. Reactogenicity post-vaccine was similar for each of the three vaccine doses and similar to the reaction seen in the placebo recipients. Efficacy estimates are difficult to interpret given the small numbers and limited follow-up size. And the impact of the longer interval in the trial between dose two and dose three on efficacy, reactogenicity, or safety are unknown. Next slide. So moving on to other considerations for benefits and harms. Next slide. First for COVID vaccines and seropositivity, the Omicron wave surges that the pediatric COVID-19 hospitalization occurred even with high seroprevalence. Again, suggesting that this alone is not sufficient to provide broad protection. Many millions of seropositive individuals have been vaccinated without safety concerns. Vaccination remains the safest strategy for preventing complications from SARS-CoV-2 infection and offers additional protection against reinfection. And as we saw earlier, prior infection may not provide broad protection against newer SARS-CoV-2 variants. However, the clinical considerations state that for people who recently had a SARS-CoV-2 infection, they may consider delaying their COVID vaccine by three months from symptom onset or a positive test. An increased time between infection and vaccination may result in an improved immune response to vaccination and a low risk of reinfection has been observed in the weeks following infection. Next slide. Then thinking through myocarditis in young children, the image on the right is from a pre presentation from Dr. Oster earlier to ACIP. Before the COVID-19 pandemic, peaks in myocarditis hospitalizations were seen in infants and in adolescents. In adolescents, myocarditis is typically viral in etiology, and we see the male predominance. However, in infants, many cases can represent myo uh, cardiomyopathy with a congenital or genetic component. Next slide. Then we can also infer what we know regarding cardiac complications due to SARS-CoV-2 infection in young children. Cardiac complications in the setting of acute SARS-CoV-2 infection in young children are uncommon. Most cardiac complications post SARS-CoV-2 infection in infants are related to MISC. 1.8% of MISC cases are children six through 11 months. However, uh, infants less than one year of age with MISC have severe cardiovascular involvement in about 55 to 65% of cases. And this is contrasted to around 80% in adolescent populations. Next slide. Then Dr. Shima Bakuro has shown these data to ACIP at the last meeting, but the reporting rate of VAERS for myocarditis following the Pfizer vaccine in male children ages five through 11 after dose two of the primary series is slightly elevated when compared to the background incidence. 
Otherwise, reporting rates are within the background in, uh, incidents. In addition, data aren't shown here, um, but you saw it at the last meeting that to date, myocarditis and pericarditis have not statistically signaled in the VSD uh, surveillance in children ages 5 through 11 years. Next slide. So overall, the risk of myocarditis after mRNA COVID-19 vaccination, if any, in young children is unknown. No cases occurred during the clinical trials, and there were almost 8,000 who had at least seven days of follow-up. However, the trials were not powered to detect rare adverse events. Based on the epidemiology of classic myocarditis, as well as what we know from safety monitoring in children ages 5 through 11, myocarditis after mRNA COVID-19 vaccination in young children is anticipated to be rare. This is likely due to multiple factors, including the underlying epidemiology of myocarditis fundamentally being different in infants. In addition, the dose used in young children is even lower than the dose used in the 5 through 11 population. Next slide. Then we heard from Dr. Link Gellis's presentation yesterday, as, but summarizing that in older children and adolescents, we have real-world VE data to show that two doses can provide good protection against severe disease and against MISC. Next slide. We calculated a number needed to vaccinate using the following methods. Benefits were calculated per 1 million fully vaccinated with an mRNA vaccine, focusing on the age group six months through four years. We used pandemic average age-specific incidence rates with hospitalization rates from COVID-net and case rates from our case-based surveillance. We assumed a VE against hospitalization ranging from 42 to 84 percent and assumed the VE against symptomatic infection ranging from 30 to 60 percent and used a 120-day time horizon. Next slide. Among children ages six months through four years, 600 to 1,300 vaccinations are needed to prevent one case. And 6,100 to 12,000 vaccinations are needed to prevent one hospitalization over a 120 day period. Next slide. However, to put these numbers in a bit more context, this slide compares the numbers needed to vaccinate to prevent one hospitalization for COVID compared to influenza. To make the methods comparable, we then used COVID-19 rates from an influenza season, which was October through uh, 1st through April 29th, and extended the time horizon out to six months. The VE assumptions remain the same from the previous slide. And under these set of assumptions, making them comparable between COVID and flu, we see that the number needed to vaccinate to prevent one COVID hospitalization ranges from 1,600 to 3,300 in comparison, and then the number needed to vaccinate for one flu hospitalization uh, in, in this similar age group is uh, 1,000 to 6,800. Next slide. In summary, for the known and potential benefits, the clinical trials provide data for protection against symptomatic infection. Then the clinical trials were not powered to detect efficacy against severe disease in young children. But similar patterns are expected to what is seen in everyone five and over with higher protection against severe disease. Emerging data in adults suggests that post-COVID conditions may be less likely to occur in vaccinated individuals. And vaccination in this age group may also provide parents with increased confidence to return to pre-pandemic activities, improving social interactions for young children. Next slide. So a summary for known and potential harms. The clinical trial data provided safety data in nearly 8,000 vaccinated young children. Note that this is a larger safety database than any of the prior pediatric age groups for COVID vaccines. We also have post-authorization safety data after almost 600 million doses of COVID-19 vaccines given in the United States. Post-authorization safety data for children ages 5 through 11 are very reassuring. The reporting rates of myocarditis in males are only slightly elevated compared to the background incidents, likely related to both uh, underlying epidemiology of myocarditis and dose de-escalation. Next slide. So in summary for benefits and harms, these are the first COVID-19 vaccine clinical trials conducted exclusively during the Omicron predominance. Post-authorization VE studies have shown a lower effectiveness during Omicron compared to the previous SARS-CoV-2 variants. 
both mRNA COVID-19 vaccines for young children met the non-inferiority criteria for neutralizing antibody levels. And we've noted differences in certainty of efficacy estimates for each of the mRNA vaccines and cannot directly compare their efficacy estimates. Importantly, though, we know that receipt of a primary COVID-19 vaccine series can provide protection against COVID-19 disease and severe outcomes. Therefore, reviewing the totality of this data, the benefits of the COVID vaccines in young children outweigh possible risks. Next slide. So the work group felt that the desired anticipated effects were moderate to large, um, reflecting some uncertainty with regards to the efficacy estimates. Next slide. Then the work group felt the undesirable anticipated effects were minimal to small. Next slide. So then for manufacturer specific, the work group judgment for Moderna specifically felt that the desirable effects outweighed the undesirable effects. Next slide. The work group felt the same, that the desirable effects outweighed undesirable for the Pfizer vaccine as well. Next slide. Now to values. Next slide. A survey designed by CDC and the University of Iowa, or RANS Corporation, to assess parental beliefs and attitudes towards pediatric COVID vaccines among children six months through four years was collected in February. Next slide. At that time, around half of parents aged six months through four years said that they would definitely or probably vaccinate their child once they become eligible. Next slide. And a third of parents six through four years, six months through four years, said that they definitely or probably would not vaccinate their child once eligible. Next slide. Only a fifth of respondents said that they would get their child vaccinated within three months after becoming eligible, but additional populations said that they would with subsequent time. Next slide. Then at that time, parents were asked about preference for a two-dose or a three-dose series with some uncertainty around the timing availability. There was a slight preference for a two-dose series, but overall, at that time, with no data on VE or the timing of when these vaccines would be available, there was no strong preference either way. Next slide. The percentage of parents aged six months through four years who definitely or probably would vaccinate their child when eligible varied by gender of the parent, by race and ethnicity, and by education. Next slide. Then these are data from the NIS COVID module. You can see that over time, the population that reported they would definitely get their child vaccinated has declined with 33% uh, in May. This could be due to a variety of factors, including a declining sense of urgency with the pandemic. In May, 17% of parents reported that they definitely would not get their child vaccinated. Next slide. Then when we look at this by age subgroups, we can see a smaller percent of parents of children ages 6 through 23 months and tend to have their child vaccinated compared to parents of children 2 through 4 years. Next slide. One in five, this is uh, from the KFF um, surveys, one in five parents and children under five said they were eager to vaccinate their child and would do so right away once a COVID vaccine was authorized. Almost four in 10 parents said they wanted to wait and see before getting their child vaccinated. Another four in 10 said they were reluctant to get their child vaccinated with 11% saying they would only do it if they were required and 27% said they would definitely not get their child vaccinated. Next slide. We know that lack of information may be a factor in parents' reluctance to have their younger children vaccinated right away. A majority of parents of children under five at the time of this survey said that they didn't have enough information about the safety and effectiveness of COVID vaccines. However, I wanna note that this survey was done in April, which was prior to having information on the safety and efficacy of COVID vaccines in young children. I just want to highlight, though, how important it is having uh, education on safety and effectiveness and how that can impact acceptability for parents. Next slide. So in summary, half of parents ages six months through four years definitely or probably would get vaccinated once eligible. One in five parents of children are eager to vaccinate and plan to do so right away once the vaccine is available, but many others remain cautious. And then again, in a survey conducted prior to available data, parents under five said they didn't have enough information, just highlighting the importance of communicating these data broadly to parents. Next slide. 
So the work group felt that it varied with what the population felt for the balance of uh, desirable and undesirable effects. No, next slide. And then not surprisingly, when asked if there was variability, they felt that there was. Next slide. So moving to acceptability. Next slide. As we've seen before, a child's pediatrician or healthcare provider remains the top trusted source for vaccine information for parents. Next slide. And we've already discussed at today's ACIP meeting um, the involvement of the VFC or Vaccine for Children's program, uh, with many of the VFC providers being enrolled as COVID providers. And we know for young children especially, this program will be important. Next slide. Then there are a variety of other uh, programs that will be important to engage as we reach children uh, in this young age group, including the Indian Health Service and Urban Indian Programs, the HRSA program, with a goal to identify priority locations for an efficient rollout and equitable vaccine access. Next slide. We also heard earlier uh, with a goal of um, over 85% of children living within five miles of a vaccine provider. Next slide. So in summary, the child's healthcare provider continues to be the top trusted source of information with a variety of programs to facilitate this rollout and acceptability among providers. Next slide. So the work group felt that yes, vaccines, the mRNA COVID-19 vaccines were acceptable to stakeholders. Next slide. Now for feasibility, next slide. This figure shows the Moderna vaccine products across the ages. The product for six months through five years of age ships at minus 20 and has a different color border, the magenta one on the far left of the image. It is a different concentration than the adult primary series. It will have a new NDC code and it does not require diluent. Next slide. Then the Pfizer vaccine for children six months through four years of age ships at minus 80 like all current COVID-19 vaccines, has a similar product configuration to the 5 through 11 vaccine, but with a different color cap, so it's the maroon one on the far right of the image, has a different amount of diluent added and a new uh, NDC code as well. Next slide. We've already discussed today, but the product configuration for both products currently are 10 dose vials and cartons of 10 vials each, so 100 doses total leading to a minimum order quantity of 100 doses per product. Ancillary supplies will be provided for both vaccine products, including pediatric specific needles, and diluent will be provided with the Pfizer orders. Next slide. So overall, the Pfizer vaccine for children ages six months through four years, it's a similar product configuration to other Pfizer pediatric products, with the, but this time with the maroon cap, but it may be more familiar to pediatric healthcare providers. The long-term storage requires an ultra-low temp freezer, and it does require diluent. For the Moderna vaccine for children six months through five years, it may be less familiar to pediatric healthcare providers. But the product is able to be stored at traditional freezer temperatures and does not require diluent. Next slide. Overall, the work group felt the Moderna vaccine was feasible to implement. Next slide. And the work group also felt that the Pfizer vaccine was feasible to implement. However, discussions on the work group highlighted that the lack of diluent and other storage issues may make the Moderna vaccine more feasible to implement, especially for new providers to the COVID vaccine program. Next slide. For resource use. Guys, we're almost there. <laughs> Next slide. So no studies were found that evaluated cost effectiveness of COVID-19 vaccination among children. Studies in adults have shown that COVID-19 vaccine-related healthcare costs could be billions or trillions of dollars. Given this, COVID vaccines overall are likely cost-saving. In a study conducted by Pfizer, they estimated that the Pfizer vaccine use in children, I mean, in individuals 12 and over in 2021, avert, may have averted 9 million cases, almost 700,000 hospitalizations, and over 100,000 deaths, which would have resulted in 30 billion dollars of direct uh, healthcare cost savings. At this time, a vaccine will not be will be available at no cost to the recipient. And as we've discussed previously, cost effectiveness is not a primary driver for decision making during the pandemic, but will continue to be reassessed in the future. Next slide. So the work group felt that the mRNA COVID vaccines in young children were a reasonable and efficient allocation of resources. 
Next slide. Then for equity, I want to take just a moment to note that we're working to make improvements to the equity domain, and ACIP will hear more about this at future meetings. Next slide. This slide shows COVID weekly cases by race and ethnicity among children less than four. All children saw an uh, increase during the Omicron surge, but note the considerable increase among American Indian and Alaskan Native children. Next slide. And this again is from the NIS child survey and you can see parental intent varies by race and ethnicity and household income on the left, as well as metropolitan area with again lower intent among rural providers, I mean rural individuals as we've seen, and then much higher intent among those who have previously received their flu vaccine. Next slide. There were also HHS focus groups that were conducted focusing on uh, race and ethnicity, specifically for uh, some of the focus groups, and another of the overall population without a specific race and ethnicity focus. Next slide. I won't read each of these in detail, but we wanted to include them all so you can come back and read them. This slide shows for parents of children six months through two years of age. Several parents um, again noted the importance of a pediatric, uh, the pediatrician recommendation. And many parents again discussed the importance of time with several parents noting uh, a wait and see approach. Next slide. Then this slide again shows for parents of children two through four years of age, again discussing the importance from a trusted source or noting their own personal experience with COVID or COVID vaccine was really impacting their decision on to vaccinate their young child. Next slide. So summarizing the major themes that were seen uh, among uh, in these focus groups. Again, parents' personal experience with COVID informs their personal, uh, the importance of the vaccine. Then on the focus groups, we've heard the pervasive idea that children are not at high risk for having severe COVID which we addressed with data again earlier today. And again, many parents highlighted the importance of time and the desire to wait and see. Next slide. So then these next two slides will highlight where we're trying to take the equity domain in the future. Instead of it being a binary question, we're trying to identify actions that can be taken to improve equity regarding COVID vaccines. First, we know CDC and healthcare providers are uh, trusted sources for parents. Parents want to discuss both the pros and the cons of vaccination. Ads need to include representative images, including diversity in race and ethnicity and in gender. Public health and clinical trial research must be inclusive of all populations from before research initiation through completion and dissemination. Next slide. Then there are ways that communities can help improve equity as well. We know pediatricians and VFC providers can provide vaccines, but they won't be the, uh, the only uh, providers of these vaccines. In many areas, pharmacies, community or rural health clinics can also help administer vaccines. And school providers could allow broader access, as well as partnerships through both community and faith-based organizations. Next slide. Then as we discussed earlier, it's difficult to rate equity through a single question. So again, we're going to do more to try to focus on calls to action. Next slide. So in summary, next slide. These were the work group interpretations for the ETR domains. Next slide. Then the overall work group interpretation. The work group discussed each mRNA COVID vaccine primary series compared to no vaccine. Both mRNA COVID-19 primary series in young children met the non-inferiority endpoints provide protection against symptomatic disease and are expected to provide higher protection against severe disease. Two vaccine options in this population may allow parents and providers a choice, which could increase uptake and acceptability. Next slide. So the work group felt that the two doses of 25 micrograms of the Moderna vaccine, that the desirable consequences clearly outweigh the undesirable consequences. Next slide and the work group proposed to ACIP to recommend the intervention. Next slide. Then for three doses of three micrograms of the Pfizer vaccine, the work group again felt that the desirable consequences clearly outweighed the undesirable consequences, although did note that there was more uncertainty with this outcome. Next slide. 
but the work group still proposed to ACIP to recommend the intervention. Next slide. In summary, since the beginning of the COVID pandemic, among US children six months through four years of age, there have been over 2 million cases, over 20,000 hospitalizations, and over 200 deaths. COVID-19 can cause severe disease and death among children, including children without underlying medical conditions. Future surges will continue to impact children, with unvaccinated children remaining at higher risk of severe outcomes. Next slide. As with all other age groups, the priority is vaccination of unvaccinated individuals. Expansion of vaccine recommendations down to children six months of age would allow an additional 18.7 million children to receive a primary COVID-19 vaccine series. Next slide. Then we'll move to the clinical considerations in just a second, but highlighting that this would be the proposed schedule for children who are not moderately to severely immunocompromised. There are three doses of a Pfizer primary series and two doses of Moderna. For children who are moderately to severely immunocompromised, an additional dose is added for Moderna at least four weeks. An additional dose for immunocompromised children after Pfizer was not authorized given uh, uncertainties on how to extrapolate the adult data seen for uh, an additional dose after a two-dose primary series um, to the three-dose primary series in this age group. Next slide. So again, the current data are for a two-dose with Moderna or a three-dose Pfizer primary series. We will monitor post-authorization vaccine effectiveness studies to help determine this timing and subsequent need for boosters, with an acknowledgement that immunocompromised children may also need additional doses for optimal protection. We'll watch this data very closely and can update recommendations as needed. Next slide. All right, then I want to apologize because you're stuck with me a little bit longer. <laughs> Dr. Hall is on the line and will answer questions, and she gets full credit for how amazing these slides are, but she is in the process of losing her voice. <laughs> so I'm going to also walk through these clinical consideration slides, and she is here for questions, although give me a minute so I can take a sip of water. <laughs> okay, next slide. We will go over the pediatric vaccination schedule for six months through four years with Pfizer and six months through five with Moderna. Formulation and dosage for these age group, administration as well as co-administration and patient counseling. Next slide. Then I also want to highlight to where these clinical resources are located. The first is a link that takes to the interim clinical consideration, which will be updated uh, after ACIP. Additionally, there are several links to other supplemental con clinical considerations resources. Next slide. Then this again are clinical resources and job aids via vaccine product, which can be found at the link listed on this slide. Next slide. Then there are additional some resources for educating vaccine recipients and parents and caregivers, including social media graphics, posters, videos, customizable vaccination letter templates for parents, fact sheets for parents, and more, which can be found at the link on this slide. Next slide. So jumping into the vaccination schedule, next slide. Again, noting that age ranges are different, that Moderna is, uh, for this youngest age group is six months through five, and Pfizer is six months through four. And then I do want to clarify and meant to say this earlier, that the dash means through, which is up to and including. This means the upper age range includes that year through the last day before their birth date. So this applies to all age ranges that we've talked about today. Next slide. So again, first for the pediatric schedule for the Moderna vaccine, starting at the top in teal for people who are not moderate or severely immunocompromised, all children six months through five years of age would receive a two-dose primary series separated by four to eight weeks. Then shown in gold is the schedule for people who are moderate or severely immunocompromised. All children who are six months through five years should receive a three-dose primary series separated by four weeks. Just like when uh, the other COVID vaccines were first authorized by age group, only primary series do doses are authorized at this time. We don't have boosters currently authorized, um, but may have recommendations for those in the future. Next slide. Next, we'll look at the Pfizer vaccine for ages six months through four years. A three-dose primary series is recommended for those, who, um, for both of those who are moderate to severely immunocompromised and those who are not. 
But starting with the TEAL schedule for those who are not immunocompromised, dose one and dose two could be separated by three to eight weeks, and dose two and dose three are separated by eight weeks. For those who are immunocompromised, dose one and dose two are separated by three weeks. Dose two and dose three, again, are separated by at least eight weeks. And again, booster doses are not authorized to this age group, but we may have recommendations for those in the future. Next slide. Then this slide brings together the new schedule for six months through five years with all existing pediatric recommendations for those who are not immunocompromised. Next slide. And this slide shows the pediatric recommendations for those who are immunocompromised. Depending on age and products, people six through 17 years who are immunocompromised should receive between a total of three and five doses. Next slide. So we're going to talk a little bit more about that uh, three or four to eight week interval between dose one and dose two, and when it may be appropriate to use the shorter authorized interval of three to four weeks, or when it would be appropriate to use the longer eight week interval. This can be used in anyone six months through 64 years of age. The benefits and risks can be weighed with individual patients based on their characteristics and situations. Next slide. On one hand, the shorter interval is more appropriate when the protection needs to be achieved the soonest. These situations could include being immunocompromised or living with an, uh, an underlying medical condition that would put somebody at higher risk for severe disease, living with a household member who is at increased risk for severe disease who cannot be vaccinated due to contraindication, or living, going to school in, or traveling to an area with high COVID-19 community levels. Next slide. On the other hand, the longer interval may be more important in some situations when the priority is to reduce the myocarditis risk. Some studies in adolescents and adults have shown that the small risk of myocarditis associated with the mRNA COVID-19 vaccines may be reduced with the longer interval. The use of this longer interval would be especially important in adolescents and young adult males where we see that highest risk. Another instance would be to optimize vaccine effectiveness, which may be increased with a longer interval, keeping in mind that this is balanced with a risk of remaining uh, not fully protected for a longer period of time. Extending the interval to beyond eight weeks has not been shown to provide additional benefit. Next slide. So now I'll walk through the new formulations. Next slide. Children should, should receive the age-appropriate vaccine formulation and follow the schedule based on their age on the day of vaccination, regardless of their size or weight. If a person moves from a younger age group to an older age group during the primary series or between the primary series and receipt of a booster dose, they should receive the vaccine dosage for the older age group for all subsequent doses. However, FDA authorizations do allow for some different dosing for certain age transitions. I also want to say that there will be an upcoming uh, clinician education call uh, that we'll do early next week that will dive into uh, a variety of the scenarios for aging up into the next age group. We'll also have additional slides posted on the ACIP website that will walk through all of these um, possible options. Next slide. So which formulation should be used for each age group? We'll start with the three Pfizer formulations. Next slide. Each formulation for ages six months through four years has a maroon cap. Each dose has the mRNA concentration of three microgram. There's dilution with 2.2 mLs of diluent, and the injection volume is 0.2 mLs after dilution and 10 doses per vial. Next slide. Then as a reminder, these are the two formulations currently available. The formulation for ages 5 through 11 with an orange cap and the formulation of 12 and over with a gray cap. Um, and neither of these formulations should be used in children six months through four years of age. Next slide. This is a sample of what the maroon cap formulation of what the label will look like. There are a couple of uh, inaccuracies to note. The maroon cap vial labels and carton may state that a vial should be discarded six hours after dilution. Stability studies supersede the, the vial label and support discarding the product after 12 hours rather than six hours. Additionally, the vial label may state ages two through less than five years, but it can be used in children ages six months through four years. Next slide. Now we'll take a look at the Moderna formulations. Next slide. The new formulation labeled for six months through five years has a dark blue cap and a magenta label border. 
Each dose has that mRNA concentration of 25 micrograms. The formulation should not be diluted and has an injection volume of 0.25 mLs, and there are 10 doses per vial. Next slide. The currently available formulation has a red cap and a light blue label. And although we're not discussing the older groups today, we'll mention that the EUA for this formulation was amended this week from ages 18 down to ages 12 and over. And we'll discuss those recommendations in an ACIP meeting next week. The primary series dose will continue for this older age group will continue to be 100 micrograms or 0.5 mLs. And this vaccine is also not diluted. Next slide. So then here's a look at the label for the six months through five year formulation with the magenta border. Next slide. COVID-19 vaccines are not interchangeable. The same mRNA vaccine product should be used for all doses of the primary series. In, acceptable, in exceptional situations in which the mRNA product administered from the previous doses of the primary series cannot be determined or is not available, either age-appropriate available mRNA COVID-19 vaccine product may be administered at a minimum interval of 28 days between doses to complete the primary series. Next slide. Next slide. As is currently the recommendation, we continue to plan with the guidance that COVID-19 vaccines may be administered without regard to timing of other vaccines. This includes both simultaneous administration of COVID-19 vaccine and other vaccines on the same day or at any time before or after another vaccine. We have extensive experience with non-COVID-19 vaccines that have demonstrated that immunogenicity and adverse event profiles are generally similar when vaccines are administered simultaneously as when they are administered alone. However, the data assessing the outcomes of simultaneous administration of COVID-19 with other vaccines are limited currently, including any potential to increase reactogenicity when COVID-19 and other vaccines are administered at the same basis. Therefore, providers can make decisions about co-administration on a case-by-case -case basis. Next slide. In accordance with the general best practice, routine administration for all age-appropriate doses of vaccine when simul it simultaneously is recommended when for children for whom there are no specific contraindications at the time of the healthcare visit. When deciding whether to co-administer another vaccine with a COVID vaccine, providers and guardians can consider whether a child is behind or at risk of becoming behind on their recommended vaccine. We know that during the COVID-19 pandemic, children have gotten behind on other routine vaccines. Parents and providers can also consider the likelihood of the child returning for another vaccination visit, their risk of the vaccine preventable diseases and risk of severe disease if infected, and the reactogenicity profile of the vaccines. Next slide. As always, best practices for multiple injection include labeling the syringe with the name and dosage of the vaccine, lot number, initials of the preparer, and the exact beyond use time if applicable. The vaccines administered at a single site visit, providers should administer each injection at a different injection site. Recommended sites um, such as the vastus lateralis and deltoid uh, have multiple injection sites and separate them by one inch or more if possible. Then administering the COVID vaccines and vaccines that may be more likely to cause a local reaction can be administered in different limbs if possible. Additionally, vaccines that may be known to be more painful, such as MMR, could also be administered after the other vaccine. Next slide. Then this is important because we take a closer look um, at the catch up, the importance of catch up vaccination and avoiding missed opportunities to vaccinate. This is what we know about vaccination coverage since the pandemic. Vaccination coverage among kindergartners nationwide was lower during the 2020 to 2021 school year compared with the 2019-2020 school year. There was 94% coverage for MMR, DTaP, and varicella at a level just below this healthy people target of 95%. Coverage for all three vaccines decreased in a majority of states. We know that during the 2020-2021 school year, 10% of school principals reported that fewer students were fully vaccinated. 27% of school nurses reported that fewer students were vaccinated in that school year. And 46% of school nurses reported that school vaccination requirements were uh, a lower or much lower priority compared to recent years. Next slide. Well, I can tell you what the slide may have shown, and we'll make sure when it's posted that it's got the, the slide. But what it 
looked at was the vaccines for children or VFC orders um, for flu components, I mean, for the non-flu vaccines uh, by year. Overall, what it showed is that we saw a dramatic increase, a decrease in orders from uh, the 2019 um, baseline. It decreased in 2020. In 2021, and then to date in 2022, there has been some catch up for that, but we are still uh, seeing orders at this point that are about 4% lower than the same time in uh, 2019 pre-pandemic. Just emphasizing the gap that we need to make up with routine vaccination and the importance of the opportunities with COVID vaccines that could play a role in that catch up. Next slide. Okay. Oh, maybe it was a built slide. My bad. Okay. There's the 2020. <laughs> Do you want a next slide? And then there's 2021 and 2022. So you can see we're overall, maybe go one more slide. I apologize, I didn't realize this was built. Okay, there we go. So there's the 2019, and you can see that, that there has been some catch up over time, but we're still below that 2019 pre-pandemic levels. Next slide. Next slide. So then in clinical trials, um, we know that children tend to experience similar, um, or, but maybe fewer side effects compared with adolescents or young adults. Providers should counsel parents and guardians on the potential side effects. We know local side effects may include pain, swelling, and redness at the injection site, as well as axillary or inguinal lymphadenopathy. Systemic side effects may include fever, fatigue, headache, chills, myalgia, and arthralgia. And in the younger children and infants, we may see irritability, crying, sleepiness, and loss of appetite. Next slide. Then febrile seizures were rare uh, in the COVID-19 clinical trials for young children. In most cases, simultaneous vaccine does not lead to higher rates of febrile seizures. Although administering more than one vaccine at the same clinic visit has been associated with an increased risk of febrile seizures for some specific vaccines in young children. The impact of co-administration with COVID-19 and routine vaccines on the risk of febrile seizures has not been specifically studied to date. We do know that febrile seizures are not uncommon and can occur in infants and young children with any condition that causes a fever. Up to 5% of children younger than five will have at least one febrile seizure. They can occur with vaccination, but are uncommon. We also know that nearly all children who have a febrile seizure recover quickly and do not have any permanent neurologic damage. CDC and FDA are gonna closely monitor COVID-19 vaccines to identify any safety signals. Next slide. So back to wrap up the very end of ETR. Um, Again, as we've said, as with all ages, post-authorization safety and effectiveness monitoring will be critical. We have platforms in place to monitor vaccine effectiveness, and the results will be communicated publicly as soon as possible. As we heard yesterday, timing of these results will depend on vaccine uptake as well as COVID-19 incidents. And then highlighting that COVID-19 vaccines are being administered under the most intensive vaccine safety effort in US history. Next slide. Specifically, I want to highlight vSafe, a CDC smartphone-based monitoring program. Next slide. For these young children, parents can complete the surveys on behalf of their child, and by doing so, will provide critical information in the post-authorization monitoring. Next slide. Then healthcare providers can also help by promoting vSafe in their practice through information sheets, posters, and QR codes. And all of that information is available at the links on these slides. Next slide. We made it. <laughs> so after reviewing what was considered a considerable totality of the data, these are the questions we're posing to ACIP. Should vaccination with the Moderna COVID-19 vaccine, two doses, 25 micrograms, be recommended for persons six months through five years of age under an EUA? And should vaccination with the Pfizer vaccine, three doses, three micrograms, be recommended for children six months through four years of age under an EUA? One more slide. You do not get through nearly 170 slides without an unbelievably fantastic team. So I just want to highlight these individuals. Megan Wallace, Danny, uh, Mulia, Lauren Roper, the team that has done an unbelievable data review. 
uh, Alicia Hall, uh, Mary Chamberlain, Sue Goldstein that have done all of the amazing work you saw with the slides on the clinical consideration and literally our entire team, uh, uh, Evelyn Twentyman. I just want to say thank you to everyone. Uh, this has been uh, an, an intense couple of weeks, um, but hopefully um, bringing the totality of the data to ACIP, it's been worth it. Okay, we can go back to a slide for the questions. And Dr. Lee, I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Dr. Oliver. I am. Um, we're going to give you a minute to catch your breath, and then what I'm going to suggest is the following. So, uh, thank you for that excellent presentation. It was a lot of information, and so what I'm going to suggest is a little bit different than our usual. Uh, I want to make sure we're systematic about understanding and discussing the various evidence to recommendations domains, so that we can have this um, discussion with the public. Um, and uh, I will ask. Um, the sort of for comments and questions in different sections. I'm saying this out loud because um, as usual, we'll ask our ACIP members and then our liaisons to weigh in. Um, but I'm gonna actually chunk it up by section and ask if folks can kind of hold on future questions in this way. So the first area we'll cover, we're gonna focus on the public health problem first, then we'll move to benefits and harms, then we'll move to values and acceptability, then we'll move to feasibility, resource use, and equity, and then we'll move to clinical considerations. And once we've had a chance to discuss all of the questions that the committee members and our liaisons have, I'd like to come back and make sure we are able to answer these questions. Of course, things will not fit in those buckets, so please feel free to ask questions along the way, but I do wanna make sure we systematically cover all of the areas because I personally had about 15 questions as you were going through your presentation. And I want to give a, a chance for everybody to ask all of their questions in public view. Um, so with that, I'm going to ask first, and again, as a reminder, we're going to chunk it into sections. So I will invite the liaisons to ask specifically about various sections. Um, and then again, an opportunity at the end for everybody. Uh, we're going to go back to the public health domain, uh, Dr. Oliver. And I want to make sure that as we go back to those um, that section of the slides, that our ACIP members are able to ask any questions that they may have about understanding uh, the epidemiology and the public health burden of COVID-19 in this age group. So I invite ACIP members to raise their hands and then liaison members. Thank you. Dr. Long. Uh, yes, thanks. It seems like yesterday that you began this um, presentation this morning, Sarah. Uh, thank you so much. It's a lot. So um, one of the things that was new uh, to me that you presented today, and you probably should put up that slide, it's the slide about, um, uh, hosp I don't know what it was, I think it was hospitalizations. That's really my question. Hospitalizations or infections um, in people who have had previous infection who were and weren't immunized. That was that was something we have not discussed as a group. There it is. So reinfection. So these are reinfection. We don't have a definition of clinical asymptomatic, but it's definitely not uh, just people who are hospitalized, right? Correct. We were, I get knowing how long the presentation was, we were trying to, to make it succinct. There is an MMWR that was specifically had data on hospitalization uh, that shows very similar findings. And so it, there is the reference at the bottom. So we wanted to show that for both infection and hospitalization, you find very similar trends where those who were previously infected, especially those who were infected prior to Omicron, um, appear to have less protection, uh, again, against both infection and hospitalization. We just didn't walk through the data for both studies. Um, and then each additional vaccine dose uh, provides additional protection. So my question really is, um, if you could just, I think you partially answered the question, but I'm really interested in um, uh, the protection against hospitalization and deaths in uh, not children, you might only have the data in older people, um, 
how much protection is there against the worst outcomes from um, infection alone? And I know we know all the vagaries of the responses, et cetera. Yeah, so, you know, I will say it's it's difficult uh, to make kind of one sweeping generalization that fits all ages and, and variant situations. Um, I will say, um, it, can we go forward to one more slide? <clears throat> this did, um, was specifically for children. They were five through, I think, mm -hmm. 20, 21 years of age, so a, a, a pediatric-ish cohort. Um, and they included children that were hospitalized. This was, again, um, in children who had been infected pre-Omicron, um, but they were hospitalized with COVID. And when they looked at their neutralizing antibodies, those who had been infected and even had severe infections um, enough to require hospitalization, they were not able to neutralize the, you know, the naturally produced infection antibodies were not able to neutralize um, all of the variants of concern quite as broadly uh, as the sera from children who had been vaccinated. So again, I, I don't know that I can kind of make an, a broad statement, um, but we do know that especially the infection prior to Omicron has not provided as much protection as we've emerged into the new uh, Omicron variant. That's, that's very helpful. And then the other thing is, I know you proposed that the surge in hospitalizations, despite zero prevalence, um, is is uh, evidence. Um, I don't think we can say that because it's all a numbers game. You know, the incidence of the, of infection per hundred thousand children. If we knew that, uh, we would know if that statement uh, of yours about the surge occurring despite zero prevalence. It's just that at the moment, there isn't a family that we know as pediatricians in, in Philadelphia or New York City that, that haven't had Omicron. So the incidence per 100,000 of infections has to be tremendous. So you could still not know if all those that were hospitalized, the majority were hospitalized, were with or without um, uh, pre-existing antibody. And then the very other comment is that I think people are very confused and the news media is confusing them further. When we use the word rates, people under think about that as the rate of hospitalization is the rate of infected people who then require hospitalization. And the rates that you showed us were really incidents per 100,000. So I hope we use incidents per 100,000 so people will understand that we're not talking about um, the rates for those infected because I don't really know that number. Do you know that number? And during Omicron, the incidents uh, or the rates of hospitalization infected individual in this age group. You're right. The COVID net, yes. It, so COVID net is population based, which is why we're able to say rate. But it is yes, population in their catchment area. We're not correcting for population in the catchment area who were infected, but then subsequently got hospitalized. Um, we could we could see if maybe in future meetings there. I mean, uh, there's a way that we could get that, but that's not what we've reported to date. Correct. Thank you. Thank you. I'll lower my hand. Um, Dr. Daly. Yeah, thanks. Thanks so much. Thanks, Dr. Oliver, for that presentation. I, I think um, these slides are very helpful. I, I had sort of similar questions about these these set of slides, so sort of stay on this topic for a sec. Um, I think these slides to me make the case quite well that prior infection doesn't prevent future infection. Um, but in looking at the public comments, there have been some comments my child had mild infection last time, so I think that means that he or she will have mild infection next time if they get infected. So what do we know about that question? Thank you. Thanks, and I will say that, you know, skipping ahead, but that was also a, a, a um, comment that seemed to come up in those focus groups a lot, that, that people's own experience with COVID, if they had severe COVID, they were more likely to get vaccinated because they didn't want their child to have severe COVID. But if they knew either their child or other children that had had mild COVID, it really framed how we thought of that. 
Um, You know, I will say overall, essentially what we have learned throughout the COVID pandemic is that we're not really good at predicting what's going to happen in the future. Um, And so I think what we know is that um, there are additional, um, it is highly likely that we will be in a situation where there are subsequent variants. Again, what we know from this is that in, that vaccination can provide uh, a broad neutralizing antibody response that can potentially um, broadly protect against um, variants we have um, and will monitor very closely, but hopefully also against variants in the future. Um, we also know that children um, who were hospitalized and had severe disease did not all have underlying medical conditions. And so we know that we are also not good at predicting which children are going to unfortunately have uh, severe or even potentially fatal outcomes with a SARS-CoV-2 infection. Um, so that vaccination uh, is really the safest way to get to that broad um, protection against the, the current circulating variants uh, and what we hope are the future circulating variants as well. Yeah, thanks very much. Thank you. Dr. Sanchez? Yes, um, and I'm actually um, still staying on the same focus. Um, Sarah, that was a great presentation and quite lots of, of, lots of information, but also lots of very useful information. With the previous slide, um, I think we really just, I just feel like a lot of this has to be uh, the main focus, because when we're when you're showing us and that seventy percent of this population may have been already infected, it really the um, you know the teaching points moving forward need to really emphasize this. And I was just wondering in this slide here, um, do you know the age of these individuals? I think this was an adult study. Um, we don't we don't have as much information as we move into to the the pediatric age group. So we'll continue to monitor really closely. I don't exactly remember the exact median age, and I don't know if anybody on our data team can <laughs> speak up. But it was an adult study. I will say that for sure. Thanks. Okay. Okay. No, that's that's helpful. Um, and then going to the next uh, slide, which is really this is it's really an important study. And I was just wondering, did they look at, and do we have any information on prior infection with then vaccinated and looking at the neutralizing antibody response? Um, you know, it is said that in adult studies that um, natural infection combined with vaccine uh, provides the actual, the highest or the broader um, neutralizing antibody activity. And I was just wondering if we have any data of that, of that in um in children um thanks i will say for especially for 5 through 11 um as they were only recommended for vaccination really right um, prior to the Omicron surge. And then we've just not seen the uptake of vaccine vaccination um, as, as much as we would like. It's a little bit more difficult to in that five through 11 um, cohort, although that will be uh, a critical area of um, important research as we go moving forward. I may see if Dr. Um, Ruth Link Gellis wants to say anything about from an adult, I mean, from an adolescent or, a, or adult standpoint on um, the, the concept of prior infection and vaccination with the studies they're doing. Sure, this is Ruth. Um, yeah, so I, I would just add that I think, uh, you know, we don't have great data in children um, at this point, but for adults, we certainly know that there is a, a meaningful effectiveness of vaccines against hospitalization amongst people with prior infection, uh, which is to say that people that have had prior infection, we still see substantial vaccine effectiveness, um, so substantial added protection um, from getting the vaccine that we know that the patterns for VE in infection in children and adults are similar. I think, um, you know, it's not a big stretch to say that we would expect the vaccine to still have, to still offer meaningful additional protection um, against severe disease in children who have been previously infected. Thank you. Thank you. I have um, actually one follow-up question, and I think it's two slides before this, or perhaps a comment and maybe a question. And, oh no, maybe it was from yesterday. 
<laughs> oh, maybe maybe this is the slide. Okay, so taking a look at the syrup prevalence data, um, you know, I just want to point out that at least you know a third to nearly a half of uh, kids were already infected going into Omicron, uh, and presumably a lot of this is you know the BA1, BA2 wave, um, and so. I guess my my read of the data, and I you know I would love some feedback on this, is that uh, prior infection, although we can't we don't have individual level data, but if at least a third of individuals were affected and uh, already infected, it didn't seem to as a pop at a population level uh, offer protection against this uh, BA1 BA2 Omicron wave. And then we're also hearing about um, reports coming from Europe and other areas that the BA4, BA5 wave is um, that reinfection is occurring even if you had BA1 with Omicron. So I am worried that we still have a vulnerable population at risk. And, you know, we're hearing that perhaps BA4, BA5 looks more severe than the BA1, BA2 infections. So I don't know if there's any additional data that CDC has uh, specific to um, the variants, subvariants within Omicron um, and you know, for me, that raises a concern about whether or not prior infection is at all protective and that vaccines could potentially afford additional robust and reliable protection um, in kids who I think still remain vulnerable. Thanks. I don't think Dr. Jones, who is, um, I don't think he was able to join us today, but he had kind of provided some additional, and, and I think we're aware of that, that, that even, unfortunately, prior infection uh, with with the earlier um, Omicron may not um, provide as much protection uh, even against subsequent newer uh, Omicron strains. So again, just, just re-emphasizing that point that um, we're seeing kind of a broader protection that you're able to get from vaccination um, and that the combined, you know, infection plus vaccination, which a lot of us may be in, um, but that, that combined protection uh, is really the, the safest and the most effective. This is Dr. Christy Clark, co-lead of the seroprevalence team. I can speak to this somewhat as well. Fantastic. Thank um, you, Dr. Clark. So, <laughs> absolutely, Dr. Oliver. So, um, so yeah, if you're uh, looking at, at this, um, one limitation that's important to note from the seroprevalence data is that it does uh, show evidence, uh, long-lasting evidence of anti-nucleocapsid antibody for at least two years. Once someone has had one infection with COVID, um, it does not um, represent new infections. So these are all kind of increases in the percentage of people who have had at least one um, uh, uh, infection uh, with uh, SARS-CoV-2 um, since the beginning of the pandemic. Um, however, um, if you do look at um, some of the d additional um, data um, from our, our uh, blood donor seroprevalence uh, data, which is um, focused on adult data, um, it does show also there that there was, you know, a high um, uh, seroprevalence among among many adults, and and we do know that we had the the high spikes um, within the Omicron wave, um, and we do feel that um, you know when you are infected with Omicron, um, you know it is uh, still important uh, to be vaccinated uh, because of the data already shown, and also because it, it widens. Uh, the protection um, uh, to include uh, the original, which um, we know that all variants will be, um, you know, descended uh, from the original, even though uh, some are not related within each other. In terms of the BA4, BA5, there is some emerging evidence um, that um, there is reinfection among people who were uh, who were infected with with BA1, and that's still an area of ongoing study. But I, I would uh, concur with with your concern there. Over. Thank you. Um, Dr. Sanchez, did you have another question? Yeah, I just wanted a comment. And basically, I absolutely agree with your comments, Grace. And and I think that this um, is important for the messaging that we have to get out, that we know already that even adults and adolescents who have who've been vaccinated, they can still get um, and we, I mean, obviously we say, we're saying it all the time. We're still getting um, COVID infections even after vaccination. Um, the combined may provide better immunity long-term, but we, our goal must remain prevention of severe infection, hospitalization and, and death and, and what have you. And so I think that has to be a continuing message. And I mean, that it's not just to prevent infection. I think that was, uh, you know, early on, something that 
I think the messaging was wrong in the adults, in the adult population. And so I think that to improve um, and to try to decrease vaccine hesitancy, we, our goal must be to prevent more serious infection in these children as well. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sanchez. Dr. Brooks? Yeah, uh, can you go to slide 14? I believe it's 14. It's right near these. Right. So first of all, Dr. Oliver, um, Herculean effort today in terms of the presentation and um, you, you deserve one day off this week, okay? So get that one day. Um, I, I interpreted this slide, and I don't know if it's accurate to interpret it that way, but if you notice the, the lines parallel each other up until you get into the Omicron wave where the six month to four year olds uh, have an increase in the hospitalization rate that supersedes the uh, 12 to 17 year olds. And I'm wondering if this is because these other two age groups have some vaccine coverage, not a lot. But I'm thinking that their vaccine coverage blunted them getting hospitalized versus these six month to four year olds, even though they had high seroprevalence, still ended up getting hospitalized. So I think that the concept, again, that many have spoken is that prior infection, natural infection does not confer immunity that is would make one comfortable enough not to get vaccinated. Thank you, Dr. Brooks, and um, concur that she needs more than a day off. She probably needs a month off after. <laughs> <laughs> um, Dr. Long. I, I agree with Dr. Brooks' conclusion, but I think the explanation for this equally is that with the Omicron and its transmissibility and ability to infect six to four, six months to four years, it's a new population infected. So, you know, these are not hospitalizations per infection. These are hospitalizations for 100,000 people. So I think that coronavirus found a new target uh, with the Omicron most recently. Um, but the other thing I, I wanted to say in regards to what Dr. Sanchez says, which is very, very important, is that I know the CDC is not using the words breakthrough. But we should also try to tell everybody else in the world not to talk about breakthrough infections. Breakthrough infections are, are reasonable when we talk about a vaccine that causes sterilizing immunity that causes lifetime protection like the, the uh, uh, measles and varicella and those. We need to be sure that people are understanding more and more that it is the nature to have reinfections with respiratory viruses particularly. So reinfections are typical for RSV, for coronavirus, for influenza, and for bacteria that cause um, uh, respiratory infection only like pertussis. So that we, we, talk, we should talk about the concept, the likelihood of reinfections, the importance of changing organisms, the susceptibility to uh, reinfections that can be severe. And it, influenza is, is a good example of that because one has previously had influenza doesn't mean they're not gonna get severe influenza. And it seems that it's a little different for RSV that doesn't change much. So I think it's very important the way we talk about this is expected. Reinfections are expected rather than um, it's a failure of the vaccine, which I know nobody on this call believes. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Long. Um, are there any questions from our liaison members about the public health burden? Dr. Shaw. Good morning, everyone. Thanks, Dr. Lee. Um, I want to commend Dr. Oliver again. I've, I've had the, the pleasure of listening to your presentations now for around two years, and you once again deserve the Oscar for clarity. Um, I, I had a question going back to that same nucleus of, of slides that others were already discussing around reinfection. Um, this is as much a, a messaging question as it is an empirical one, but sometimes we... Um, I'm gathering, and what we've already started hearing from parents at state health departments is a very reasonable uh, notion that my child was previously infected. And so um, I get that 
the vaccines are all good and everything, but my child doesn't need one because they already have that immunity on board. And I, I wonder if either right now or in the future, as we roll out the vaccine, uh, a focus of the messaging could be to elucidate what the not so marginal benefit of vaccination is on top of uh, uh, viral induced immunity. Uh, the Kaplan-Meier curve is, is great, but very, very difficult to digest. Um, so if there is a way to, in, in everyday terms, walk parents through what the additional benefit of vaccination is for those 70% of kids, uh, that would be very, very helpful for the efforts of state health department. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shaw. Excellent comment. not see any other hands raised. So we're going to move on to the section of uh, benefits and harms. Um, and we'll ask if my uh, ACIP members have any questions or clarifications uh, that they'd like to bring up in this section. Mrs. Nally. Thank you. I just want to make sure that we have an understanding about whether parents can give Tylenol or Motrin to their children if they experience side effects. Thank you, Ms. McNally. The answer to that is a resounding absolutely yes. <laughs> um, anytime the, the child has uh, symptoms uh, after vaccine, an age-appropriate uh, dose of, of whatever pain reliever of choice uh, is absolutely encouraged. Um, we do tend to say um, don't give it before the vaccine um, in anticipation, you know, of, of the, the events. But if the child has fever, sore arm, uh, or leg, fussy, any of this, absolutely, uh, it's okay to give um, you know, appropriate Tylenol, Motrin, uh, whichever. I think we lost you, Dr. Oliver, but we got the gist of it. <laughs> um, any additional questions colleagues have? Dr. Daly. Yeah, so, so, so Dr. Oliver, another theme that I've been hearing is that it, it sounds like these vaccines are less effective in kids than, than the original um, sort of estimates of effectiveness in, in, in adults. And I know that you walked through that really well with us in terms of the impact of Omicron, for example. But, but I think if, if, if you wouldn't mind just when we're talking about benefits and harms, I'm trying to think which slide this is, but just sort of our ability to reinforce the message that we anticipate based on experience in older age groups that vaccine effectiveness for both of these vaccines is likely to be much higher against hospitalization and death than the reported in the in the papers, uh, vaccine effectiveness from the clinical trials. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. And, and again, I, 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 oh, sorry, what else? No. And I, and I just asked this because it's a question that I've been asked by, by parents. Thank you. No, absolutely. And, and I think it is, it is absolutely worth restating that, that the, um, point estimates that, you know, numbers that we're hearing for how well these vaccines work in the clinical trials um, are lower than what we heard when it was, you know, the adults, if we think back to the December of 2020. And that's not that these vaccines are working differently, it's that the virus has changed. Um, so, you know, the SARS-CoV-2 we were fighting in December of 2020 is just different than Omicron. And these are the first trials that really from almost start to finish, or at least from, from finish from after the, the second or third dose, where we were collecting cases during, uh, during the Omicron time period. So the comparison needs to be to other, how well the vaccines have performed uh, in other ages during Omicron, not thinking back to how necessarily the numbers we had um, uh, you know, a year and a half ago. But I will, I'll say something and then maybe turn it over and see if Dr. Link Gellis wants to say something. But I think this is a critically important slide that's saying the completion of the primary series, which we acknowledge is two doses for Moderna and three doses for Pfizer, uh, we need to, to extrapolate that to these age groups. But the completion of the primary series in the studies for post-authorization um, effectiveness for the severe disease, and that's where we have to look for severe disease, we see really good protection against hospitalization and even higher protection for MISC, which is, you know, kind of an even more severe 
um, kind of manifestation of COVID. So we continue, we expect to see the exact same thing, that, that while that protection against um, milder symptomatic infection may be a little bit lower with Omicron, which was expected because that's what we've seen for all other age groups, we expect to see a high VE against um, severe disease, against hospitalization, and against something like MISC. Dr. Gellis, Lee Gellis, anything else to add? Yeah, I think you summed it up really well. I mean, I would just emphasize, you know, I think there, there's a lot of literature out there showing the pretty distinctive drop in vaccine effectiveness for Omicron infection compared to Delta infection, especially with the two-dose primary series alone. And so I don't think that these clinical trial results um, that looked only at infection as an endpoint during Omicron were particularly surprising um, to us. And, and likewise, I think, you know, we will expect to see very high protection remaining for the more severe outcomes because we know in adults um, where, again, the patterns match for infection in kids that um, the, the protection remains substantially higher for severe disease. Thank you. Dr. Sanchez. I don't know where this exactly fits, Grace, but I had a question about the slide about asymptomatic infection with Moderna. Um, I think it was that you looked at it with the Moderna dosing, and I don't remember which slide that was, and that it didn't seem to prevent or it wasn't efficacious against asymptomatic um, infection. But my recollection yesterday um, in asking Moderna, the Moderna representative was that that data was not available or that they hadn't studied it. Um, can you just comment on that? I, um, Thanks. Um, is there something? Yeah, yeah I, I will sorry. say one thing and then we'll turn it over to Dr. Wallace, who's our, our data person. I will say that throughout all of the clinical trials, Moderna has collected this information, Pfizer has not. So I think it was Pfizer that said that they didn't have uh, the data that it wasn't collected. So, so that's a little bit uh, we it was a graded outcome for Fi for Moderna because we had the data. It was not for Pfizer because they did not collect it. And then I'll let Dr. Wallace kind of walk through uh, the data here. Thanks. So um, as Dr. Oliver just said, you know, Moderna has collected this all along. But I, I will just to give some context to what we're looking at here, sort of what we hope to see for the measure of asymptomatic infection is either serial PCRs in the cohort or a um, serology taken on the entire cohort. So what Moderna has measured here is the entire cohort was tested by PCR 28 days post the second dose, and the immunogenicity subset, which was about 400 participants, had serology results. And then there were a few cases that had some unscheduled visits that came in and had PCR tests. So, you know, we, you know, I want to specify that this does have low evidence certainty because while I think that this is helpful information, it's certainly not, you know, the full picture that we would like to see. But I do think it gives a, a little bit of context to what you're looking at. Thank you. Are there any additional hands raised? Dr. Long, I see you're unmuted. I don't know if you would like to ask a question or if. Oh my goodness. I'm on meeting popcorn, but I would like to ask a question <laughs> just. Um, <laughs> I'm so sorry, I'm having a little snap. Um, I, I it, you know, it has, oh, I know what it was. Uh, have. And, you know, I don't know where this will come up, Dr. Lee, but it, it, I, I would strongly want to say that we don't want to um, quote some point estimates of efficacy against uh, severe disease, symptomatic disease, hospitalization, but rather, and I don't know where that com comes up, and I don't see that anything we've said so far, we would discuss that. But rather, we try to say um, they, by immunobridging, they um, correlate with what should be um, high protection from hospitalization and death, uh, and and not do the point estimate. Uh, 
even the point estimate for Moderna, yeah, it's okay, but there's such short intervals of follow-up that I think it could be misleading. So do you think that it's possible for us to use the language that comparable with other populations that have been very well protected against even Omicron-induced hospitalization and death rather than a point estimate for anything, and we certainly shouldn't use a point estimate for Pfizer. Before you answer that, actually, Dr. Oliver, um, can I just, I wanted to kind of add to that and um, actually go back to the, uh, it, it's very much related. I'm wondering if you can um, pull up the grade table for the two vaccines. Um, and I, I am not in, at all trying to make a comparison about the data itself, but rather the grade process. Uh, because I do think if you're able, I think it's like 38 for one, and then I don't know about the assigned number for the other, maybe slide 53. Um, but if you're able to pull those up, it would be really helpful because I wanted to highlight the utility of grade. I think I'm gonna get the numbers wrong. There, <laughs> there's one. So there's the grade um, for one vaccine. Um, and then if you're able to show that if people can glance at the um, evidence type to the right and then look at the grade for the other. Um, I, I think this is where grade is incredibly helpful in that it allows us to understand the certainty of the data that we're using for decision making. So for me, we don't typically um, uh, do this uh, in this fashion, but it gives me a sense of how the data might change in the future. And I think that's important because data always evolves as we have greater numbers and a uh, longer perspective in terms of time. Um, and our decisions might need to continue to adapt to the emerging data. So that gives us a sense of what we're basing our decisions on and the certainty around that data. Um, I just wanted to add the comment that it, it is really challenging to understand the data to Dr. Long's point when it comes out as a single number or in press releases. It's really important to emphasize to the public that press releases are not sufficient for a scientific review of that data. That data presented in those press releases, in fact, I think is challenging for us as decision makers and can confuse the public and create some more uncertainty and frustration. Um, and we don't see these data until just before our public meeting. So many of us who are asked to talk to parents about these um, data that come out through tweets and press releases can't really respond without reviewing the data. Um, I recognize that we have all felt the incredible pressure to get these vaccines out quickly. I'm incredibly grateful to our, um, our industry partners who have done so. Um, but I would emphasize that we need to do this with better upfront planning and implementation in order to minimize gaps in equitable access to vaccines. And in this case, I think you know we have uh, been very much um, feeling like we want to make sure that we can provide access to children under the age of five. Uh, so uh, this is where I do think this type of information is helpful. Um, uh, Dr. Oliver, feel free to add anything you want, um, but mine was more just a comment, I suppose. <laughs> no, I mean, thank you, Dr. Lee. That honestly was was almost exactly what I was going to say, that, that we showed, you know, as a part of the review of the totality of the data, we showed um, the point estimates, but we also showed the certainty with which we... Um, you know what we have around those, um, and agree that this was this was a time that that grade. Um, again, we you know everything is being compared to no vaccine, but I think the fact that this is done in a systematic way really does let you see the certainty we have uh, around all of this data. And if you notice that in our you know summary conclusion slides for benefits and risk, we didn't quote efficacy estimates. Um, I think we we tried to lean into. You know, there these vaccines, a primary series, provides protection against infection and will continue. You know, we uh, to provide higher protection. We uh, assume against um, more severe disease, uh, but fully agree that that um, there is differences in certainty. The fact that we're making uh, decisions based on both efficacy and immunobridging is a part of the total picture, um, and we'll monitor all of this really closely in the post authorization studies. Thanks. Dr. Lair? Thank you, Dr. Oliver, for an excellent presentation. I want to reemphasize what Dr. Long and Dr. Lee just said, that we're, I'm voting to approve this on basis of immunobridging studies and not based on the efficacy, and that when I read or hear from people that Pfizer has better efficacy in the original data, 
I feel like I need to correct them that the data is just not there yet to be able to say with certainty that that is true. Um, the certainty is not there. And so I would like to emphasize again that the immunobridging is suggesting that this is a very good vaccine and the efficacy data still needs to come in the future as we get more data. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Brooks? I, I concur 100% with what uh, Dr. Lair just said. Uh, the one question I guess it would be is on um, 1B, uh, immunobridging, evidence type 2, from the reasoning that it was not given uh, evidence type 1, it sounds like it's not possible to have a 1. And by that I mean, by definition, immunobridging cannot uh, give you a high evidence because it's immunobridging and not vaccine efficacy or effectiveness. Is that correct? Thank you. Yes, I mean, the, the reason for that is that the, the work group defined outcome was symptomatic lab confirmed COVID-19 and, and immunobridging is a surrogate of that, particularly since we don't have a correlate of protection. So by default, for now at least, any immunobridging evidence would be downgraded once for indirectness because it is a surrogate measure of, of the you know patient forward event of symptomatic lab confirmed COVID-19. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Maldonado. Thank you, uh, Dr. Oliver for that great presentation. So um, this is a personal comment. I have a separate AAP statement later on. But I, I agree with everything that's said, but I also think that it, more to your point around uh, a, a commentary and messaging to the public is that a lot of this deep diving into efficacy point estimates, uh, grade, um, uh, uh, grade uh, calculations really can serve in some ways to obfuscate the data that goes out to the public again if we don't make it very clear that relative to every other vaccine that we look at at ACIP, um, we do very similar things with similar outcomes with vaccines that are highly successful and safe and effective. So it doesn't do us a lot of favors to start um, really focusing, I think, on uh, some of the, the drawbacks of the data given what we know about many, many other vaccines that have been uh, moved forward with quite great um, effectiveness, quite uh, important achievements and reduction of disease, as you all showed earlier, uh, for data that are at, at least, uh, if, if not this good, much less um, robust. As you pointed out, we've seen over 600 million doses of these vaccines given to kids and adults already. So I really think we need to focus on that as well as, as, well as going into the deep dives of why these data are imperfect. And that would really help us as providers, by the way. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Stinchfield? Thank you. Patsy Stinchfield from NAPNAP. Dr. Oliver and team, thanks so much for amazing information. I have a question. One gap that I'm seeing in, in these studies, especially in young infants, is their potential exposure. So uh, as we heard from the parents yesterday, some parents have not had their infants out in public, and then others are in group child care you know large settings and i just wondered if there's any uh way that the manufacturers could categorize what uh young infants potential exposures are as we try to figure out our, our ve uh, whether they're symptomatic or asymptomatic thanks Thanks. I'll say something and then see if others want to want to comment. But um, I will emphasize that that's the that is one of the critical reasons why it needs to be blinded follow up. Um, and uh, that in theory, um, if a, a parent um, doesn't know if they have the vaccine or the placebo during that blinded follow up, hopefully uh, there's not a differential exposure. Um, from vaccine to placebo, um, and that's why it's it's was very difficult. We did not include any of the unblinded um, time in the efficacy estimate um, for uh, for Pfizer when there was the additional kids that were that were unblinded. Um, we do know that parents who.
who sign up for a clinical trial may be fundamentally a little bit different, maybe a little bit more, um, uh, you know, conservative and following the non-pharmaceutical interventions uh, a little bit differently than the general population. Um, but as it comes to an efficacy estimate, um, especially kind of comparing vaccine to placebo, it just emphasizes the importance of that blinded follow-up time. Um, so hopefully there's not biases um, across groups. And Dr. Daly. Daly. Oh, sorry. Oh. No, please go ahead. Sorry, this is Dr. Wallace. The only thing that I would add to that, just, you know, as you're thinking through how to, how to think about the efficacy estimates, at least for the Moderna trial, there were quite a few events. In fact, the number of events we saw in the Moderna trial was comparable to the number of events we saw in the adult EUA trials back in December 2020. So there were in, in that trial, there were meaningful, you know, exposures to the point that, that we got those meaningful number of events. Thank you. Um, we'll move on to Dr. Daly. Um, yeah, um, I wonder if we could pivot because we're discussing benefits and harms. I wonder if we could pivot to talk a little bit about vaccine safety and um, and and Dr. Oliver. It seems like we have at least sort of three lines of evidence around that. And, and I'm asking this question because it's a question I get asked from parents. It seems like we have at least at least three lines of evidence regarding safety, but then grade is going to just look at one of those lines of evidence, but then we can sort of incorporate those other two. So I think we have evidence about safety of Moderna vaccine in adults from hundreds of millions of doses. And then we have um, post-authorization and post-licensure evidence about Pfizer vaccine safety again in adults. And then we also have evidence um, specifically for Pfizer vaccine, for example, five to 11 year olds. And that's relevant because it's the age range closest in age to the age range we're talking about today. And then we have the evidence from the clinical trials. And and uh, and the grade is for each of the um, vaccines, Moderna and Pfizer, uh, based upon the clinical trial data, but then we have that additional data that helps us in, in, inform those, um, those safety considerations. And sorry, that was a little bit long, but I guess what I'm saying is if I'm asked about safety by parents, um, I would I would try to um, sort of sum that up in a way to say we have a lot of information that that indicates that these vaccines have a high degree of safety. Um, so, is is that is that sort of a uh, a fair interpretation um, of of the safety data to date? Thank you. Thanks. I may pull up a slightly different. 60. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I, I will uh, emphasize two things. Um, first of all is, you know, the safety database across these two trials had uh, nearly 8,000 individuals, which um, is, uh, you know, a considerable uh, number for a clinical trial uh, in, in what is, you know, a, um, a limited age cohort um, of children. So, so I think we do have a robust safety database from that. And then yes, 600 million doses uh, of mRNA vaccines given in the US alone. Um, and so agree that for benefits and harms we've tried to, there are very specific outcomes for grade, but then we try to bring in uh, the other things that may not specifically be grade outcomes, but what we can extrapolate from other ages, what we can extrapolate from um, expert uh, guidance and, and everything. So. Absolutely, um, emphasize these two numbers. Thank you. Are there any additional questions or uh, comments from our members or liaisons before we move on to the next section? Dr. Lee, since we're on the subject, I'd like to follow up, sure. please. Can we have confirmation that any potential harm would be covered by? Um, the countermeasure injury compensation program versus the vaccine injury compensation program? Um, I don't know if Dr. Hastings is on um, from HRSA is able to comment. Uh, I am on and as of right now, all vaccine claims are being processed through CICP. Okay, and Dr. Hastings, could you just give us an update on the status of the COVID-19 injury table? Um, I'm sorry, can you clarify, do you mean the total number of cases? 
or we do not have a CICP uh, COVID-19 vaccine specific table at this point, if that's the question. That is the question, but it is in development, is that correct? Um, it is not fully in development at this time. We're working on um, different positions. Okay, thank you very much for that information. Thank you. Any additional questions or comments? Uh, Dr. Long. I don't know if you have a plan to talk about this later, Dr. Lee, we'll do that. I see the vote is going to be, uh, do we recommend? And um, we usually have language around that. And um, thinking about what Dr. Maldonado said, and one of the comments from the FDA from, I think it was Dr. Fink yesterday, um, I want to make it certain for parents and for the public that we recommend this vaccine all children six months and older should be immunized against COVID. It, it, you know, we talk a lot about the safety and we talk a lot about the data and it, we may lose the, the, the notion that we're in the business of saving children's lives. It's outrageous that 200 children have died if, and more will if we can prevent this. So um, I, I don't see any shoulds and mays. Uh, and so I wonder, is that coming later? Or, But I think we want to emphasize that this is to protect individual children from hospitalization, hospitalization and death. And when we talk about we can't predict who's going to get it or not, it seems as if we're being a little bit callous to those children with underlying conditions. We want to protect their lives. We want to protect children who are healthy. We want to protect their lives. And for me personally, although my career in pediatric infectious diseases has been extremely long and I have saved a few lives. I have the ability with a vote today to save more lives than my particular decisions in extremely sick children have saved for my career. So we don't want to lose track of, uh, you know, with all of this, uh, of maybe being soft on um, what we may allow parents who wish was, I think Dr. Fink's word, wish to immunize their children that they now can. We wanna say that if you're not gonna immunize your children, we think that that's misplaced concern uh, and that you should immunize your children to save their lives. And was that gonna come up someplace else? And I, I, I yeah. jumped. No, well, um, thank you, Dr. Long. First of all, I really appreciate you expressing your opinions on this. Um, second, I, I, we will get to the uh, recommendations slide later. I do want to systematically work through the rest just to make sure we've answered all the questions. Um, but, uh, and I will, oh, it looks like, okay, <laughs> I, that we will get to that very soon. If, if folks feel like there aren't any other questions in the additional sections, we'll get there even sooner. Uh, but I just want to make sure, make sure we have opportunity for that. Dr. Fink? Um, just to respond to Dr. Long, uh, maybe it would be helpful if, if I could repeat what I, I said yesterday in my, in my FDA update. What I said was that the authorization of these two vaccines gives parents and caregivers options uh, in choosing how to best protect their children uh, against COVID. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Fink. Um, Dr. Sanchez? First of all, I want to agree completely with Dr. Long. I think we need to make this a recommendation and and really um, support it. But I just have, and I don't know if it fits here. I just wanted to make some comments about some questions about immunocompromised. Is that, can I comment here or do you want to leave it later? Uh, I think that's fine, Dr. Sanchez. Please go ahead. But we will we'll get through the next two sections as well. But I think that it relates to benefit risk balance, um, I assume. Yes, so I was, um, I had a question about the recommendations for the Moderna with the immunocompromised. 
I don't believe we heard much about that, at least from uh, in yesterday's talk. Um, can you go back to that slide? And Sarah, um, I guess I, I was just, I'm not saying that I disagree with with that. It's just that um, I we at least I had not heard about the Moderna third dose for this for this age group. Yeah, thanks, um, Dr. Sanchez. I'm happy to speak, and then um, maybe can see if Dr. Fink wants to provide the FDA perspective as well. Um, so you're absolutely correct. Um, we don't have data in uh, children under five or under six uh, who are immunocompromised uh, yet. Um, for the Moderna vaccine, um, we we have kind of vast experience um, in the uh, adult and even the adolescent and five through 11 population where um, there is a two dose primary series that's recommended um, uh, for non immunocompromised um, and a third dose uh, that is recommended uh, for immunocompromised. Uh, I think the understanding was that the data that we know for five and over is uh, a little bit easier to extrapolate to uh, the Moderna product, which is a two dose primary series for um, not immunocompromised um, that we can can expect uh, kind of a similar benefit risk balance as it relates to the children uh, under five that we know for those five and over that that third dose um, a three dose primary series for for immunocompromised children. There is less understanding um, both on the data and specifically on what those intervals would be for Pfizer to take that from a three dose to a four dose primary series for immunocompromised children. Um, and so uh, the decision at this point was to um, to not uh, add an immuno dose for um, immunocompromised children to make it a four dose primary series uh, just because of the limited um, you know, data that we could extrapolate from under other age groups or understanding of, of what the appropriate intervals would be. Although we did specifically, I did try to mention this in the slide that um, we can monitor the data in immunocompromised, as, especially as we get more information on what the, the VE for Pfizer is uh, in both kind of the immunocompromised and not immunocompromised population to inform that in the future. But just wanting to highlight for Moderna, it's not that they you know did a specific study on this, it's extrapolating what we know from that two dose primary series uh, for uh, adults and, and uh, older children um, for the three dose primary series for immunocompromised. Dr. Fink, anything else? Uh, no, actually, thank you. You, you very uh, accurately uh, conveyed what, what FDA's thinking was. And I, I think you know what you're seeing here reflected is that the uh, CDC clinical considerations are, are following that thinking as well. No, thank you. And certainly it makes sense. But, but um, so the bottom line is that this is, um, um, you know, just going from the older aged and adult data um, of clinical experience to this age group, six months to five years. But we don't have um, antibody responses in that population with the Moderna dose and certainly not with Pfizer after the third dose. Uh, the correct. clinical bridging rather than immunobridging. Yeah, the, no, I mean, the, but the immunobridging was done in a not immunocompromised population yes. with the two doses. Um, so hopefully, as we've seen um, sometimes clinical trials um, uh, and or, um, you know, institutional investigations are able to get additional information in the post-authorization um, time period where we can get data and, and use that to update recommendations. So we'll be we'll be monitoring that space very closely and um, very much uh, appreciate kind of partnerships with um, academic institutions that have a specific focus on immunocompromised populations, especially immunocompromised children, um, uh, to to help collect that data. And so we'll bring it as soon as we have. But but you're correct. Uh, the the trials. The immunobridging you heard yesterday um, did not include um, immunocompromised children. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Dr. Paling. Hey, uh, this is Kathy Paling. Thank you, Dr. Oliver, for the incredible presentation. And I wanted to build on this conversation because the families of children six months to four years of age with immunocompromising conditions, children with immunocompromising conditions have been 
very worried. And I am very pleased that this is going to be an option. One of the questions I had was, in our questions, do we need to specifically vote on this question? Thank you. I will say, and Dr. Lee, maybe you can help me. I couldn't totally understand, but I think the question was, are we voting on this? Um, and I think uh, what I can say is we've had some discussion. We decided to, to vote for other... There was a vote that ACIP had for the third dose and immunocompromised broadly. Um, we have not um, specifically asked you to vote on the additional dose and immunocompromised for every um, additional age as that gets expanded. Um, we can take care of it um, in uh, from decision memos from a CDC standpoint, so it would formally be a CDC recommendation. Um, but, but at this point, we had not... Um, Posed having you specifically vote on the third dose in immunocompromised kids for Moderna only, um, but know that um, you know we'll take feedback. But that was the plan was that we could incorporate it into uh, into the CDC recommendations. Yes, I have nothing to add unless Dr. Wharton wants to comment, <laughs> and then we'll move on to the next section. Uh, no, thanks, Dr. Lee. Um, we were planning on doing that through um, a, a CDC decision, so thank you. Thank you, okay. Um, let's move on to uh, values and acceptability, and then uh, one more section after that, since a little bit more on clinical considerations, and I hope we can get to the vote. <laughs> so values and acceptability, any questions? Kathy, um, sorry, Dr. Paling, is your hand still raised? Thank you. Dr. Lee, I have a question. Of course, Ms. McNally, please go ahead. Uh, Dr. Oliver, I am struck by these numbers, 2 million cases, 20,000 hospitalizations, and over 200 deaths. And I'm also concerned that there's really an underappreciation for the potential severity of a respiratory virus in kids in this age and an unclear understanding sometimes in parents about the long-term consequences, including MISC. So I, I'm, I'm looking at what I think is around slide 80. I think maybe the, the document I have and maybe the document you showed have a little bit of a difference in numbering. But I would like to understand what we can say to parents who want to wait and see before they get their children vaccinated. Yeah, thanks. Uh, was it this slide? Um, it was the one that also talked about um, reluctance and see one more. If you go forward one more. Um. Well, I mean, I think either way, I'm happy to speak to you. I think the reason that I very specifically wanted this slide in was for that exact point um, that parents are listening, parents really um, are doing the best they can to make an informed decision for their child. Uh, this is, you know, we're in a, a time that has been scary over the last uh, several years, and parents are having to balance a lot of mixed messages. They're having to, to make really tough decisions day in and day out to do what they think uh, is the best that they can do to, to keep their child safe, um, and that they're listening when we have uh, these types of information, when we, um, you know, when we post uh, information publicly, um, and you know, prior to the the availability of the data, the parents said that they absolutely did not feel like they had enough to make information about vaccine decisions, which tells me that it's on us to make sure that that information is out there uh, and is understandable um, for parents around uh, the safety and effectiveness of these vaccines. So to that end, um, we're doing everything we can from our uh, standpoint. I'll say we're having a you know clinician education calls. We're going to have parent webinars. Uh, we're going to have educational materials and social media communications. We're also uh, going to help partner with other provider organizations, with other um, you know, community organizations, but I think making sure that parents feel that they have the appropriate information to make an informed decision about this uh, is critically important. Um, and, and yeah, that was the main reason I wanted to show the slide, that the parents really are listening to, to what's out there and, um, and it's, it's on us to make sure that that information is out there and we'll, we'll do everything we can to help. Thank you. Ms. Howell. 
Hi, thank you. And thank you for the presentation. Molly Howell, representing the Association of Immunization Managers. I just wanted to comment on some of the information presented about providers enrolling to receive pediatric COVID vaccine with state health departments. And it is a, a bit lower than what we would like. And a lot of what has been mentioned around concerns around wastage with the 10 dose file. Um, and then also I think there's concerns about poor uptake and, and ordering vaccines, especially in rural areas and not having enough uptake to make it worthwhile to implement a pediatric vaccine program. I also think with the other age groups, pharmacies played a large role. And so I think some providers have become used to relying on other providers to give COVID vaccine uh, and then just competing priorities and staffing. Uh, we're also hearing from some of our providers that there are concerns about having the conversation with patients and parents about COVID vaccine is then hurting their recommendations around other vaccines. And so I think some providers are avoiding having that conversation. And so whatever can be done, as was mentioned, to arm providers with as much information, um, this entire evidence recommendation framework, if all providers could somehow understand that, I think that would be helpful. I also wanted to comment that I think a lot of providers are probably going to carry one vaccine or the other and not both. And that's because of um, the concerns about wastage, but also these vaccines are very different in their dosages and age groups. And, and just to avoid vaccine administration errors, we are hearing that providers would prefer just to have one on hand over the other. Thanks. Thank you, Michelle. Are there any other um, questions related to values and acceptability? Dr. Daly. Yeah, so I, I, I had a comment that I was going to make later that you, you've, you, you all have heard me make, but I'm going to make here because it's in direct response to Ms. McNally's question. You know, I think parents understandably have concerns. And as you said, Ms. McNally, they're hearing lots, some of which is inaccurate um, through social media, et cetera. And um, I, I think, you know, assuming we all vote to recommend these vaccines today, or depending on the outcome of that of that vote, then in many ways, I think then then the hard work only continues. And, um, you know, Ms. McNally, I agree with you that we, we have to communicate better. And what I say to these parents is, you know, please talk to your child's um, primary care provider and ask them, tell them all the concerns you have and ask them these questions and that that's a, an excellent forum for them to uh, hear updated information about what we know about the safety and the effectiveness and the, the need for these vaccines. Um, because I feel like, again, the hard work continues and um, parents trust their child's doctor who knows them and their family well. And I would, and, and I would think that in addition to all of the messaging that we're all going to do around this and all the organizations on the phone, um, that's an important venue for that conversation. And hopefully that will help um, with um, addressing the concern that you have that the message is not out there, how vitally important these vaccines are to protect children's lives. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Daly. Um, I'd like to move on briefly to feasibility, resource use, and equity domains. Dr. Bell. Well, thank you. Uh, I just want to, uh, on the topic of equity, really um, sort of uh, point everybody again to Molly Howell's excellent comments just now, which identified multiple uh, challenges to uh, broad availability and access of these vaccines in this age group. It's already a challenge in some of the older age groups. And this is, I think, particularly relevant to the issue of equity because um, because of the, the, uh, the issue of perhaps an increased dependence on uh, providers for administration of this vaccine. And one of the slides you showed, which indicated that only half of the providers were intending to um, provide vaccine to uh, children who were not enrolled in their practice. So uh, again, I think this is a situation where we really, um, there is a, a large risk of inequitable access and therefore inequitable uh, 
vaccination um, of these young children. And so I'm just, this is just a plea to, to continue your efforts uh, focused uh, specifically on these issues around uh, equity. Thank you, Dr. Bell. Dr. Whitley Williams. Yes, good morning. Can you hear me? <clears throat> yes, we can. Thank so you. Thank you, Doc. I'd like to thank Dr. Oliver uh, and the CDC team. I hope one day that the true story will be told in terms of the efforts, dedication, caring, and compassion that has gone into this whole um, epidemic uh, or preventing this epidemic, uh, pandemic. Thank you for uh, continuing, though, to build the ETR domain on health equity. So as vaccination in this age group under five years of age rolls out, it is crucial to continue to monitor vaccine uptake by race, ethnicity, especially as we uh, have seen not only in um, African Americans, Latinos, but especially in American Indian, Native Alaskans who um, were certainly at much higher risk of hospitalization. Um, I should have raised this in the public health domain, but I think it still relates to health equity. Um, it's particularly important to continue to monitor where uh, children, uh, if, if COVID-19 vaccine is approved in uh, the age group six months to five years, um, to monitor where they do receive these vaccinations. Um, you know, in the past uh, or up until now, certainly health departments sponsored uh, settings as well as federally qualified health centers along with individual pediatricians have played a major role um, in vaccinating uh, children older than five years. Um, but we do know, as has been said, regardless of race and ethnicity, a majority of the parents listen to their pediatrician. The National Medical Association's uh, annual scientific uh, assembly and scientific meeting will take place in about six weeks. This will certainly provide a wonderful opportunity to get feedback from the um, pediatricians, many of whom work uh, in communities of color, in terms of their experience and any barriers that may have been presented, obviously provided if COVID-19 is approved uh, for the younger age group. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Whitley Williams. Um, Dr. Lair. Um, I'd just like to take the time to reemphasize what Dr. Chatham Stevens and Dr. Romero said earlier. That's a quote I'm going to take back to my office. We've been trained in our careers to don't waste a dose of vaccine, and we now need to change our thinking to don't waste an opportunity to vaccinate. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lair. Dr. Hogue. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Lee, <clears throat> and I want to again reiterate the thanks to the CDC staff for the great presentations today with the clarity. Um, I'm uh, representing, as you most know, the American Pharmacists Association, and I believe that pharmacists have offered a great avenue for addressing health equity as we've gone through this pandemic and as vaccine has become available to the various um, uh, age groups, I think pharmacists have been very critical in that effort. I think oftentimes the pharmacist gets lost in the shuffle because we talk about retail pharmacies and we see big corporations and other things. But I think what the reality is, is that in most local communities, there's actually a very trusted uh, pharmacist that takes care of that community and works in that in that place. Pharmacists are uh, incredibly dedicated to ensuring that the complete health care needs of patients are met. And oftentimes we talk to our patients about uh, their need for additional medical care, medical visits, checkups, and other things. And I would just like to suggest that yeah, as we roll out the pediatric vaccine, this is a wonderful opportunity for pediatricians to reach out to their local pharmacists in the local community and let the pharmacists know what your procedures are within your practice for receiving referrals. Pharmacists may be able to persuade parents to have their children immunized. And we wanna take advantage of the opportunity to immunize those children when they're ready and when their parents are ready. But we also want to make sure that children 
uh, receive the necessary well child visit and well child check that needs to occur for all the reasons that have been stated earlier. Pharmacists are committed to working with pediatricians, family practice physicians, other primary care providers to ensure those child, children get into the system. But it's very important that locally pediatricians and family practice physicians touch base with their local pharmacies and inform them of how uh, they wish to best receive referrals because I believe pharmacists are ready to refer patients into those practices to receive those uh, visits and those checks. And we're committed to a comprehensive healthcare system and a team-based approach to bringing this pandemic to an end. Over. Thank you, Dr. Hogue. Dr. Long. Uh, one more uh, question about uh, the implementation uh, side of it. Uh, Dr. Oliver, you did say that you should only use the vaccine approved for the age on that age group, but I do know that pediatricians are trying to see if they can double up or half the volume for, for uh, one age compared with another for the vaccine that they have, because this is a lot of different doses and a lot of vaccines. So we want to reiterate that that's not, um, you're not, you, you can't do that. And then the second thing is, I, I don't know why Dr. Laird didn't jump up and down about this, but I wouldn't want to use a vaccine in which the label says one thing and I'm going to do another thing. So the six hours to the 12 hours, I can sort of say, well, we could teach people that 12 hours is okay. But to say that the age on the label isn't correct, um, I just don't understand why we can't put stickies on those labels to make the labels right. So uh, if Dr. Laird doesn't have a problem with that, I'm not the one giving the vaccine, so I wouldn't. But I think it's going to be already complicated to have a label that isn't correct is a problem. Thank you, Dr. Long. Um, Ms. Howell? Yeah, I'm uh, Molly Howell with AIM. Uh, I just wanted to take another look at this slide showing hospitalization by race in the zero to four age group. I just wanted to make sure you know, it was it was one slide, but I think it's a pretty important slide showing um, the burden on, especially on American Indians, and in my state being a state that has a high percentage of American Indian populations. I just wanted to emphasize the importance of of vaccinating this group of individuals. So, thank you. Thank you, Michelle. I don't see any additional hands raised. So uh, let me ask if there are any questions or clarifications for the clinical considerations team that anyone, anyone would like to raise. Um, I think some have already been raised um, uh, to date, but if there's any points that in our members or our liaison members would like to emphasize. Uh, Pablo, uh, Dr. Sanchez. Thanks again. Um, yes, actually I've been, I've been waiting for a couple, few comments. And so, um, First of all, I do agree with Dr. Long. I think that the labeling is of concern. I was not aware of that until today, but um, but certainly that message needs to be taken out, um, needs to be promulgated um, on all levels. But um, in terms of the clinical considerations, I have a couple of things. Um, so they clarified the chronologic age, which although the study said that it was given during, based on what the age was at the beginning, we're following other guide, guidance that if the ch child enters the subsequent age, we'll get that subsequent dose. I think that's um, important. I had a question also on administration because, and this is my own ignorance, um, intramuscular, um, I, don't, I don't see that being stated. Um, and then there's some data about inadvertent Sub Q administration, at least at the Pfizer dose, that it was it showed efficacy. I, I'd like some comment from um, Sarah or, or CDC um, about that aspect. And I have some more questions. Sarah, did you want me to jump in first and then 
Okay. I, yes, please. I see you just IM'd me. <laughs> <Okay>. Yes. <laughs> so I'll start with, I do want to respond about um, the labels because um, I, I completely understand with the comments here, it is super confusing for providers um, to, you know, have labels that aren't actually uh, correct with the age indication or the dilution. Um, and I just want to assure that we are going to be providing educational materials and restating this as a, in as many outlets as we can, whether that be webinar or, you know, our awardee emails, our partner emails. Um, so we are going to be reemphasizing this as much as we possibly can. Um, and then um, I, I do apologize. Um, I did not put anywhere in the presentation that um, it is um, intramuscular uh, injection. So I apologize for not including that in the slide deck. Um, and uh, I'm I'm so sorry that uh, I don't I don't think um, I was aware of the subcutaneous injection that had inadvertently occurred in the trials. Um, currently, um, our, our okay. recommendations for admin errors for the uh, incorrect route is actually to not repeat the dose anyway. So um, we would count that dose regardless, um, no matter what the age. I'm not sure if it was in the trials. I think there was a, an Israeli study, and I don't know if it was with military people, but um, that inadvertent sub Q, and these were adults, was still associated with um, antibody, with adequate antibody um, levels. So I think something to that effect should be stated in the clinical considerations. Just, but they're both intramuscular, and I think that um, you know, I see it there for, in the label for intramuscular use. Um, I had another question um, that in the clinical considerations that um, in terms of premature infants, I know that very few. Infants were, were um, preterm infants were enrolled, but this will come up um, because we do have 24, 25 weekers who now are six months chronologic age, not only at home, but also in the NICU. And so I think that stating some comment to um, that premature infants should be dosed at, at the given, uh, at the appropriate dose, not changed and not halved and not given smaller amounts. Um, that it should be given at the chronologic age. And I think also another comment that infants born to mothers who were vaccinated during pregnancy, that they should also be vaccinated. Um, you know, we've made a big push about maternal vaccination and antibody transfer, but um, I think that that also should be commented on that, um, that yes, they do get, they, there, there may be, there is may or there is protection of the first several months of age, but that um, that these and these children should be vaccinated irrespective of maternal uh, vaccination status. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate those suggestions. Thank you, I'm Ms. Stinchfield. Yes, thank you, Patsy Stinchfield from NapNap. Um, Alicia, I was wondering about uh, if a mixed series of products are inadvertently given what your guidance will be in that situation. Yeah, so this, this one is a little complicated and we're going to have material to um, help walk through this because um, because this age group, uh, we, we haven't yet encountered a series of different numbers of doses. So since we have the three dose for Pfizer and two dose for Moderna, so if uh, a child receives um, Pfizer, then Moderna, or Moderna, then Pfizer, whatever order, they should receive a third dose. Um, and that can um, be either Pfizer or Moderna. Oh, thank you for the visual. Um, yeah, so I, I, I have, a, uh, there's an alternate to essentially swap each of those out with the other. Um, yep, thank you. <laughs> um, and so that would then um, complete the series. And so maybe a simple way we can say it is in this age group, the way you get two doses is if both of those doses are Moderna. If it's a, if you get Pfizer for any of those doses, it needs to be a three dose. 
um, series, which I think would be consistent with how we do with like PRP OMP vaccines with Hib. If uh, the only way those count is a two dose, uh, in that is if both are the PRP OMP. So trying to be consistent with general best practices as well. But we'll make sure all of these Alicia's fantastic scenarios will be posted as a part of the slides, uh, as well as included in all of our clinical education materials. Thank you. Go ahead, Dr. Sanchez. No, I just had a question about that as well. Um, just, yeah, because it's a little bit confusing. Um, so if there's any Pfizer dose would require three complete doses, if even if one was Moderna, but if they got Moderna and Pfizer and they need a, and what if it's, if the third, if they go to a place that is only giving Pfizer, would then that be sufficient? Okay, so let me just make sure I understood your question. Yeah. If, so they, this, um, if they had Moderna and Pfizer, could they get Pfizer to finish it up? Yes. Yes, yes, they can. And would not require a third dose of Pfizer? Correct, and would not require a third dose of Pfizer. Okay, and this will be in the clinical um, considerations, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Ms. McNally. Thank you. I just wanted to comment that I think for parent educational pieces, it might be helpful if it's not already in the works to have a piece that summarizes the differences between the Moderna vaccine and the Pfizer vaccine. And also obviously in that um, document would demonstrate that they're both safe and effective. And I also think it would be helpful given what we're talking about right now with the difference um, between the, the dosing, the ages, the fact that there's um, many different types of vaccines for the different age groups. I, I think that it would be really helpful if there was a piece for parents, and maybe it's just info on the website, that talks about what they should do if their child experiences a vaccine administration error and tells them where to go. I know that piece exists for providers and it's great, but parents have different questions. Thank you. And we could uh, give that feedback to our communications um, team. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you to our clinical considerations team. I feel like we send you 100 questions after the fact as well. And we appreciate that you're always willing to consider and uh, update the clinical considerations as we go. Um, any other uh, questions for this section? Um, and while I'm waiting for any additional hands to be raised, uh, Dr. Oliver, if you could just uh, put up the vote slide. We're not going to vote yet, but I just want to make sure the, the wording is up there so people can look at that for a moment. Um, and also going to let our liaisons know that um, I will call on you shortly. Um, actually, Dr. Oliver, would you mind reading these questions? Um, we're going to have a robust discussion about this next, um, but I also wanted to make sure that we went back to our um, liaisons who wish to make a statement uh, prior to our vote. So um, if you could read these, uh, if, and uh, I suppose if there's any clarification questions, but I, I did want the, to make sure that we paused for a moment before we get to the actual vote. So, so Dr. Lee, you want me to read the vote slides? Yes, thank you. <laughs> okay, perfect, sorry. We have, um, so so two different votes uh, will be taken. Um, the first one, um, the proposed language is a two-dose Moderna COVID-19 vaccine series is recommended for children ages six months through five years under the EUA issued by FDA. The next slide. Then the next vote would be a three-dose Pfizer-BioNTech COVID-19 vaccine series is recommended for children ages six months through four years under the EUA issued by FDA. Thank you. Oh, we're not going to move to vote yet, but um, Dr. Palin, do you have any clarification questions? <laughs> Thank you. I'll make sure to still, uh, have you up first. Um, any questions about the wording? I know that questions about the wording came up earlier. I hope the wording is clear members. Ms. Bata. I think that the wording is clear and maybe we need to have these separated out, but I think 
overall, we're voting on whether we recommend um, the COVID-19 vaccine series and that the, the specifics of that um, would go under. Um, and maybe I'm just um, being uh, finicky here, but um, I, I think we want to make sure that it's clear that we're recommending one of these two vaccines if that's what we, we decide to vote on. Thank you. Um, Dr. Well, okay, let's um, go through the questions or comments specifically about the wording. Uh, we won't move to any motions yet. Dr. Long? Yes, I think I agree with, with Ms. Bata. I think there should be an introductory that says, um, coronavirus vaccine is recommended for all children ages six months. Well, you're gonna have to say through four years, I don't know what you're gonna say, six months of age and older. Uh, you could say that, six months of age and older, and that um, there are two, cho two choices of vaccines. Uh, and then then these sentences are okay. There's just something about where the comma and under the EUA doesn't really seem to fit. Do, do we, 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 we haven't said that about other vaccines, have we? Um, under the EU, EUA issued by FDA, it sounds like FDA is recommending. Um, it just seems a little awkward there. Okay. Did you all think you had to put under the EUA issued by FDA in there? Yeah, maybe I can comment. So I want to say two things. First of all, the, the vote language is just specific for the ACIP vote. So, so we need the specific vote for that vaccine. Um, to date for the COVID yeah. program, we've not had two different vaccines. We voted on the same day, but we've we've had product specific votes for everything. So we wanted to be consistent. Um, we have also had for all the vaccines that have been recommended under an EUA, we have had that language in every vote uh, that ACIP has voted wow. on um, as well. Um, so this is, you know, the, the language is incredibly consistent with, with how we voted before, but I will also say that uh, the vote language is not uh, necessarily representative of how the communications will go out. There will absolutely be a more comprehensive communication platform that would say, you know, if if both uh, receive an ACIP vote for yes, then there will be a more comprehensive uh, communication statements, MMWRs, you know, everything else that will come out that will put all of this in context. We just need uh, the specific votes uh, for the products. Um, uh, so I don't know if Dr. Long or Dr. Wharton want to want to say anything else, but I just want to be clear that the vote language is just for the recommendation, uh, but there will be much clearer, straightforward, more comprehensive communications to follow. Uh, no, th uh, that's correct, Dr. Oliver. Thank you. Thank you. And Dr. Brooks? Yeah, I concur with what Dr. Oliver said because, you know, we also talked about mixing and matching. We talked about immunocompromised three doses from Moderna, which is not in the language. I think the, the implicit understanding is that we're recommending these vaccines. Uh, this is the primary utilization, but there is a lot of nuance that will be in the detail. And we never really vote separately on each aspect of the detail. Thank you, Dr. Brooks. Okay, with that, I'm gonna suggest we take a pause from this discussion. I'm gonna ask Dr. Uh, Bonnie Maldonado from the American Academy of Pediatrics. Um, I know she would like to give a statement, so I wanted to give the floor to you, Dr. Maldonado. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Um, I'm speaking on behalf of the American Academy of Pediatrics for the, uh, to issue this short statement. So pediatricians know the power of vaccines to protect infants, children, adolescents, and entire communities against deadly and debilitating infectious diseases. We've successfully immunized millions of children and adolescents to protect them from COVID-19. Families with infants and toddlers need and deserve the same chance to protect their children against this virus. More than 30,000 children younger than five have been infected with COVID-19 and more than 500 have died. We have also seen that the impact of COVID on children has resulted in more infections, hospitalizations and deaths than from any other vaccine preventable diseases, especially among children and families experiencing health disparities. With a vaccine, we can continue to save children's lives 
especially those already at highest risk for COVID impacts. It's important for parents and caregivers to have the opportunity to talk with a trusted healthcare provider who knows their child, such as their child's pediatrician, about COVID-19 vaccine and to have their questions answered. As of June 8th, 23 million children ages 5 to 17 have received two doses of COVID vaccine, but another 26 million in this age group have yet to receive any doses. Our work is cut out for us. We must also all work together to reduce disparities and address barriers to vaccination in every community so that all children and families can benefit from the protection of these vaccines. The AAP encourages all states to work with pediatric practices to make accessing COVID vaccine as simple as possible. The AAP strongly recommends COVID-19 vaccine for all infants, children, and adolescents who do not have contraindications for using a COVID-19 vaccine authorized for use for their age. This includes primary series additional doses and or booster doses as recommended by the CDC. AAP recommends any authorized COVID-19 vaccine may be given according to CDC guidelines for age. The AAP supports co-administration of the COVID-19 vaccines with other immunizations as appropriate. An updated AAP policy statement reflecting the, the, availability of the, excuse me, the availability of safe and effective vaccines, including for children younger than five years, will be published shortly after the final decision by CDC on these vaccines. The policy statement will be published online in pediatrics and can be found by visiting the aap.org website. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Maldonado. And I know that uh, Patsy Stinchfield from NAPDAP also has a statement. I'd like to invite you to go ahead. Yes, thank you so much, Dr. Lee. Uh, Patsy Stinchfield, liaison to NAPNAP for the National Association of Pediatric Nurse Practitioners. As a provider of pediatric care for most of my 44 years in healthcare, most of which has been in pediatric infectious disease in children's hospitals, I hope the committee unanimously supports the use of both vaccines presented to us as there is nothing more tragic than losing a child to a vaccine preventable disease. As a grandmother to a three-year-old and a one-year-old, I know firsthand how hard this has been on families to wait for this vaccine protection during the pandemic. I've gotten vaccinated, boosted, and look forward to the youngest in my family getting protected as well. As the president of NAPNAP commented yesterday, pediatric nurse practitioners will be strongly recommending all children six months and older get vaccinated against the SARS-CoV-2 virus, the way that we recommend for vaccines against influenza, measles, and all primary series vaccines. I was a bit dismayed with some of the headlines coming out after the VRPAC decision emphasizing, quote, it's up to the parent. This can be misinterpreted to consider this vaccine in young children as optional. We don't say to parents of a baby with a cardiac defect, it's up to you for your child to have open heart surgery. We say your child needs open heart surgery. I hope to see headlines coming out of today's meeting that it was a unanimous vote that should be strongly recommended that our youngest children get vaccinated with these incredibly safe vaccines. At every measure, emergency room visits, hospitalization, ICU care, death, MISD, myocarditis, long COVID, reinfection, et cetera, it is clear the benefits of children getting vaccinated outweighs any potential harms. To skip vaccinating children is to take a risk for a severe COVID disease outcome. The literature tells us, and as Dr. Oliver covered this morning, a strong recommendation from their healthcare provider is the number one thing that will impact a child being protected or unprotected. Parents, please ask your questions of your healthcare provider and clinicians, please be prepared to listen well, answer questions and strongly encourage vaccination of all kids to protect them, their family and the community. We don't get out of pandemics with it's up to you type strategies. Our clear communication of a strong recommendation is something I will be dedicated to as the incoming president of the National Foundation for Infectious Diseases. I will be partnering with CDC and FDA at the end of the month on a Facebook Live event on this topic. Thank you to everyone who has dedicated so much time and effort in protecting our children. Thanks. Thank you, 
your sit field. Okay. Um, are there any uh, additional questions, clarifications, or further discussion points ACIP members would like to make at this time? I don't see any hands raised. So I'm going to ask our voting members uh, to make a motion on this first vote. And Dr. Paling, thank you for raising your hand. Yes, I'd like to make a motion to accept the wording as written. Thank you. Thank you. So this is for the two-dose Moderna COVID-19 vaccine series recommendation. Um, uh, we have a motion on the table. Would anyone like to second the motion? Ms. Bata. I second the motion. Thank you. We moved and seconded that we adopt the recommendation language presented here on the slide on the two-dose Moderna COVID-19 vaccine series for children ages six months to five years. Um, let's move on to vote number two. And again, um, ask if anybody has any questions or discussion points they'd like to make before we make a motion. Uh, Ms. Howell. And I don't know if this is too late. I was just gonna suggest, I'm wondering if instead of a dash between six months, if it could say through, if that would be clear to the public that it's six months through four years. And same with on the previous recommendation. Thanks. We'll we'll make sure that that is very clearly communicated. I've I've tried to say it that um, when we had the in dash that it was through, but we'll make sure that things are written out in the in the communication. Thank you, Ms. Howell and Dr. Oliver. Um, so, do any of our voting members wish to make a motion? Dr. Bell. Yes, I'm, I'm happy to make this motion. Thank you. So we have the motion for the three-dose Pfizer BioNTech COVID-19 vaccine series recommendation. And um, do we have a second, Dr. Sanchez? Yes, I'd like to second it. Thank you, Dr. Sanchez. So it's been moved and seconded that we adopt the recommendation language presented here on this slide for the three-dose Pfizer BioNTech COVID-19 vaccine series for children aged six months through four years of age. Um, any additional questions or issues that need discussion? We've had a very robust discussion to date. So I'm going to actually, and I don't see any additional hands raised. I'm going to assume the committee has no objections to proceeding with a vote. If ACIP members could please turn on your video. Um, I will um, go around and ask uh, voting members to state your name, whether you have a conflict of interest, and then your vote. So we're going to go back to vote number one which is the two-dose Moderna COVID-19 vaccine series. Um, I believe I see cameras on. So uh, give me a moment to pull up my sheet. I have to make sure I get all the numbers for each vote. Thank you. So uh, today we'll go in order just to make it easier. <laughs> um, Ms. Bata. Lynn Bata, no conflict, yes. Thank you. Dr. Bell. Beth Bell, no conflict, yes. Thank you. Dr. Brooks. Oliver Brooks, no conflicts, yes. Thank you. Dr. Chen. Wilbur Chen, no conflicts, yes. Thank you. Dr. Daly. At Daly, no conflicts, yes. Thank you. Um, Dr. Lair. Jamie Lair, no conflicts, yes. Thank you. Dr. Long. Sarah Long, no conflict, yes. Thank you. Ms. McNally. Veronica McNally, no conflicts, yes. Thank you. Dr. Paling. Kathy Paling, no conflicts, yes. Thank you. Dr. Sanchez. Well, Sanchez, no conflict, yes. Thank you. Dr. Talbot. Skip Talbot, no conflicts, yes. And uh, Grace Lee, no conflicts, yes. So I believe the tally, Dr. Wharton, you can correct me, is 12 yeses, zero noes, and so the motion would pass the stand. 
Uh, okay. That is what that is what I got as well. Thank you, Dr. Okay. Thank you. Next, we'll move to vote number two, which is a three-dose Pfizer BioNTech vaccine series is recommended for children ages six months through four years of age. Um, and today, we will start with um, Dr. Lair. Dr. Jamie Lair, no conflicts. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Daly. Pat Daly, no conflicts. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Chen. Wilbur Chen, no conflicts. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Brooks. Oliver Brooks, no conflicts. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Bell. Beth Bell, no conflicts. Yes. Thank you, Ms. Bata. Lynn Bata, no conflicts. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Talbot. Kim Talbot, no conflicts. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Sanchez. Pablo Sanchez, no conflict, yes. Thank you, Dr. Paley. Kathy Paley, no conflict, yes. Thank you. Ms. McNally. Veronica McNally, no conflict, yes. Thank you. Dr. Long. Sarah Long, no conflict, yes. Thank you. And Grace Lee, no conflicts, yes. So this vote passes with 12 yeses and zero noes, and the motion passes as stands. Dr. Wharton, anything else there? Um, uh, no, uh, I concur with your count on the vote. It was 12 <laughs> zero. Thank you. I can never count in real time. Um, so I wanted to take a moment to just invite our members. Um, if anyone would like to make a statement, um, to please feel free to raise your hand and do so. Dr. Bell. Yes, thank you. I just wanted to um, reiterate uh, some of the points that some of my colleagues have made during this uh, discussion today and say that, um, you know, uh, this is, uh, as oftentimes is the case, about balancing benefits and harms. And this is an opportunity which one doesn't get very often, to participate in preventing the death of children, of young children. And any death, of course, is a tragedy. A death in a young child is an incredible tragedy. And we know that this disease is killing children. So um, on the harm side, uh, so far, all the information that we have is good. Um, we have more information than we often have with other vaccines. Um, and I think, you know, anyone making an important decision about anything, especially for their children, want to consider that balance. Yes, we don't know everything that there is to be known about this. Yes, the data may change. But we have a bottom line here, which is that this infection kills children and we have an opportunity to prevent that. And every parent will want to consider that calculus as well. So I'm really, um, as I say, I, I've, obviously we all take our responsibility extremely seriously, but here is an opportunity to prevent a known risk. And I think we've made a big step forward today. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bell. Dr. Brooks? Yes. So I really don't want to echo what, what Dr. Bell said. There are 18.7 million children that we just now authorized to get vaccinated. There have been over 2 million cases in these children, 200 plus deaths. And I think an interesting aspect is we don't know what's coming. We don't know what's going to really happen with BA4 or 5 and then what other variants we may see. But I feel comfortable in, in saying that I that vaccinating will be a benefit, a net benefit. We don't know how much, but it will be a net benefit. So we are making the decision that will help the children that we know now will get a certain level of efficacy. But going forward, there will be benefit over the next months and years with these decisions. Obviously, more vaccine will be given, but we've taken a major step forward today. 
Thank you, Dr. Brooks. Any other comments? Daily. Yeah, um, I wanted to um, make a couple brief comments. Just that, um, you know, um, we have heard the public comment, both in the public comment period yesterday and in the docket. And, and my docket is open on my computer. And so, you know, we've heard pleas to approve these vaccines, but we've also heard pleas not to approve these vaccines. And, and I just want to explicitly state that we we, we hear you. Um, for those who disagree with the decisions that we've made today, we, we hear you. You've emphasized some things. You've emphasized that you don't think these vaccines are effective. We've shown data to show that they are. You've emphasized that you have concerns that they're not safe. And we have, I think, uh, a good safety database to, to indicate that they have a high degree of safety. Um, and and I just want to state explicitly that we've we've heard those comments and we've we've taken those into consideration and we've still made the votes that we that we have and we've made the votes that we have for the reasons articulated um, by Dr. Brooks and by Dr. Bell that we feel like we have a, an opportunity to prevent severe disease and death in this in this age group. But I would reiterate that the work continues and we need to continue to communicate this as best as we can to the public. We need to continue to monitor vaccine efficacy and safety. And so, um, you know, I'm excited about this vote because of the opportunity to prevent um, these deaths, but I also acknowledge that, that, that our work continues. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Daly. Any other members like to make a statement? Okay, I'll just chime in that I want to say that I am um, fully confident that vaccines should be recommended. Um, we can clearly prevent hospitalizations and deaths. Um, and I believe we have the potential to prevent long-term complications of infection that we don't yet understand well. I'm actually really concerned that the long-term implications of infection over time, um, it, that's gonna probably be the next big public health burden that we face. Uh, and I am particularly concerned about our children. So my hope is that uh, this will allow us to take one step forward in the right direction and that we'll continue to make progress over time. Uh, so I thank all my committee members. And I see Dr. Romero has his hand raised. Dr. Romero, would you like to leave us with a few parting words? Yes, I would. Thank you very much. Um, I'm not sure if uh, you can see me. Um, I, I had not wanted to upstage your final comment, but I just simply wanted to um, thank the members, the voting members of the ACIP the liaisons, the ex-officios, um, uh, all the members of the CDC that have uh, put time uh, into making this decision. Um, I, I, as someone who has sat where you sit today, uh, understand how much of an effort uh, goes into this, and more so, how much of an effort has gone forward since I have left. So again, thank you very much um, uh, from, from, uh, from the NCIRD, um, and um, again, um, a much-deserved rest this weekend and to the fathers in the group, happy Father's Day. Uh, you, uh, you are doing an incredible job of protecting our children. Thank you again and have a restful weekend. Thank you, Dr. Romero. Um, and with that, um, I wanna again, thank everyone uh, for your commitment to ACIP and to our process. Dr. Wharton, is there anything else you'd like to add before I adjourn the meeting? Uh, no, I think Dr. Romero has spoke very well on behalf of CDC, so I will I will leave it with that. Thank you. Are there any objections to adjourning today's meeting? Hearing none, uh, today's ACIP meeting is now adjourned, and I hope everyone enjoys the rest of your Saturday, and happy Father's Day to everybody tomorrow. Thank you, everyone, for your time today. Good job, Dr. Lee.